Inherited Luck, book four of the Twisted Luck series. Written by Mel Todd. Narrated by Autumn Juliet. To all the people I've lost in 2020, you gave me love I'll never forget. Madge Eaton, grandmother. Howard Lowry, friend. Aubrey Todd, father. You are missed. Chapter One. Mages are some of the most powerful people around, and Merlin Neville are deadly at all times, instilling great control, caution, and humility in these mages should always be the primary goal. Power isn't useful if it is used for selfish reasons. Chin Dynasty Ah! Stupid system! Work! I glared at the computer screen as I tried once more to put in my magic branches and strengths for the draft board. It wasn't programmed to handle a double Merlin and kept tossing errors. I'd finished my bachelor's degree in June and was trying to file my intended major for my master's and my course of study for my doctorate, but the stupid system refused to accept any input. Sixteen months ago, I'd climbed out of the rubble of a school building I destroyed when trying to not get killed by two mages from Japan. The fact that I lived, much less got Japan to quit trying to kill me for an inheritance, still surprised me. The fact that only one student had died eased my guilt, and I was found not responsible for their death, as I had been fighting for my life. But I never wanted to kill anyone, even if it had been Daniela Morris, someone I'd barely been able to tolerate in the first place. The fallout, however, had been severe, but somehow I'd managed to not get expelled. First responders were everywhere, dealing with the destruction and injuries. But Japan had lived up to what they promised to the Phoenix Georgas and me. Before the ambulances left, there had been representatives from Japan there, personally apologizing to the president of GA Magtech and taking full responsibility. Money had been handed out like water, though I didn't get any, and even the damage to the Guzman's shop had been completely covered by Japan. As if thinking about her, summoned her, My friend Joe Guzman came into the apartment. Joe was my best friend in the world. Transform archmage, proud lesbian Latina, and my soul sister. She was curvy and gorgeous, with skin that reminded me of roasted nutmegs, and hair that touched her butt. Mages did magic via genetic offerings. Hair, nails, blood, things like that. Which meant you never cut your hair as you needed it to do magic which meant her thick, black, silky hair weighed a ton and annoyed her. When I was 12, I met Joe a few months after my brother Stevie died in my arms, and from that day on, we were inseparable. We'd experienced a lot over the last few years, and I knew I would have never gotten my bachelor's degree without her support. The three of us, which included Joe's girlfriend, Sable Lancet, lived together in a decent college apartment. The living room, crammed with three desks, a futon couch, a club chair, and a 43-inch TV meant you weaved between desk chairs and the small coffee table. The apartments weren't bad, but they were still college apartments with puke-bland walls, not enough bookshelves, and a kitchen that made a boat galley seem large. But for the last two years, it had been my home more of a home than I'd ever had before. Sable was wisely avoiding me by hiding back in their bedroom, trying to wedge clean laundry into the packed closet. Joe was a clothes horse at the best of times. I could hear you yelling at the computer through the door. Should we start running now before your annoyance sets Murphy's luck on all of us? Her lilting voice teased, but it also brought into clarity the prickling sensation that had been at the bottom of my awareness. The familiar light prickling, almost like goosebumps, of Murphy's cloak started to settle around me. 
I had the bad habit when I was frustrated or upset to unconsciously cast the spell on myself, and then I'd feed it, all unconsciously. The bad thing was the spell affected probabilities in the negative way, meaning everything that could go wrong would. Dang it. I dispelled it with a grunt of irritation and stared at the forms. You're overthinking this, Joe pointed out. Copy everything into an email and send it to the contact link on the website. Sable said she had to do the same thing because her requested masters wasn't on the dropdown. Don't worry about it and just send it. She pulled out the bundle of snail mail and started sorting it. I took a deep breath and typed out the email, putting in everything I'd been trying to do via the website. I fought a sigh as I started to type. Because of my power, being a double Merlin meant rather than access to one class of magic and three branches, like a standard mage, or access to all the classes, but only five branches, like most Merlins, I had access to eight branches. Having a familiar gave me that eighth branch. Coruscant Monroe, double Merlin. Strong. Relativity. Time. Earth. Soul. Psychic. Pale. Transform. Entropy. Non-organic. Bachelors in biology. Minor in soul. 4.0 4.0 GPA, providing master's degree selection information and justification per draft requirements, including is my doctoral path with possible career paths. Magic wrapped around my world and wove through it. There were five ranks of mages, and Merlin was the highest level. And until me, no one knew you could emerge twice which made me both a freak and a pawn in a game I wasn't interested in. Emerging is what gaining magical abilities was called. Most people would get a class, order, chaos, or spirit, and then get to use three of the four branches in the class. But not me. Instead, I got access to almost everything. And it had been proven that even the branches I supposedly didn't have access to, I could use which meant the government was very interested in which degree I would choose and how they would use my draft service. The ranks of mages were hedge mage, magician, wizard, archmage, and, of course, Merlin. And all mages above a hedge mage had to serve a draft period. Merlin served for a decade instead of four years. I shook my head and kept typing in all the information they wanted. They knew who I was, Why did I have to provide all this crap? When I was finished, the monitor glared at me like a disapproving drill instructor, like typing the email had been the wrong thing to do. I wrinkled my nose at the website and killed that tab. That'll teach websites to be uncooperative. We owe money. Asking for money. Spam insurance. Elections. Spam. Elections. Hey, an actual piece of mail for you. Joe sorted through the pile of mail. We only picked it up once every other week or so because 90% of it was junk mail we didn't care about, and the mailbox was on the other side of the apartments and in a direction we almost never went. I just nodded at her comment, still staring at the computer screen. If I sent this, I was committed. Why did an email seem more final than entering something on a form? You're stressing again. I can smell calories burning. And here you go, mail for you. Looks official, Joe said as she dropped an envelope on my desk and peered over my shoulder. Her perfume, a mix of ozone and sharp metal, touched with honey sweetness, wrapped around me, bringing emotional support, if nothing else. I know, I'm just... I waved my hands in the air, not sure what I was, except annoyed. She paused and patted my head. Well... I can solve part of that. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw her arm flash down and grab my mouse. Before I could react, she clicked send. Eek! What did you do? My heart went into triple time, and I lunged towards the screen as if I could undo what she had done. Saved you some angst? It's done, and there isn't anything you can do to call it back. Let it be. They'll approve it or they won't. Joe flashed a smile a bit harder than her normal smiles as she gave me a nudge with her shoulder. With that, she headed down the hall to the bedroom she shared with Sable, her steps a bit slower than normal. 
I frowned, but the pounding of my heart had me focusing on the computer, wanting to reach in and pull back the electronic packets. But she was right. There wasn't anything I could do, and I would have spent another 20 minutes fretting over sending the email. I moved my attention to the letter she'd dropped on my desk. I frowned at the small manila envelope reading, Coruscant Monroe, written in crisp, clear calligraphy. I knew it wasn't my degree, that I'd received last week. It had taken 18 months of busting my butt, dealing with the pressure from the government, and avoiding the societies. The societies. Even the thought of them made me sigh. They should have been such a good thing. But I'd heard too many horror stories about how they were the worst parts of an old boys club and a gang. They wanted me. Or to be more exact, they wanted to use me. They were the equivalent of frat houses for mages, each catering to different classes and personalities of mages. I joined the House of Emrys, but only because the Merlin House was the least of the evils. The others still kept trying to convince me to join, and various people I didn't know in Emrys kept offering to help me out. It did wonders on making my paranoia worse. The bright spot in the last year, besides Joe and Sable, had been building odd friendships with Indira Humbert, my mentor and one-time professor, and with Stephen Alexant, FBI agent, government stooge, and Indira's boyfriend. The only student I'd developed any relationship with was Charles Wainscott. He was an archmage and had a familiar named Erichina. She and my familiar, Carolian, were friends. All in all, the last year had worn me to the bone and made it so I did little besides study, work, and have nightmares about failing. But I would made it. I earned my degree and met the conditions of the will. Oh, it's probably about that. I sighed, suddenly exhausted as I stared at the envelope, which had gained a level of menace it hadn't had previously. I still tended to hide from most people, mainly because after the building incident, I was more than a bit infamous. Yes, Japan paid for a brand new building and accepted all blame, which was the only reason I wasn't kicked out or prosecuted. I didn't know of anyone who really missed the one person who had died. Maybe her parents? But she hadn't made herself well-liked. Magic didn't always make sense the way it worked at least to me, and with all the training I'd had, both from GA Magtech and Banyarl, I didn't think we humans understood magic as well as we liked to think. Maybe that's why most Merlins retire to private research, and why the government wants James' research. It explains magic more accurately? I let the thought rumble around my mind as I picked up the envelope and studied it. I could hear Joe talking to Sable in the background. Sable finished her master's this summer and wasn't going to go for a doctorate. Joe still had another year to get her bachelor's. Carolian yawned and stretched. He was my feline familiar, one of my best friends, and probably the closest thing I had to family right now. He rose to his full height and jumped off the couch. He was still growing. And every so often, he scared me when I forgot who he was. He had reached the size of a cougar, but with bright ruby red fur and a tail he used as a whip. When people saw him walk down the street by my side, it made them take a triple look. The thought of what he could do with those claws, what I'd seen him do with his claws, made me swallow hard. I looked back at the email program. The scent box proving my missive was long gone. Was it even worth the fight? It seemed like all I did was fight to live my life, but no one else had any issues. My heart began to race, and the familiar prickles of Murphy started up again. I took a deep breath in through my nose and out through my mouth, forcing myself to relax. I continued until the prickles dissipated and I didn't need to fight down the scream at the back of my mind. Screw it. I'll decide when they reply. While normally the submission of your chosen degree path after your bachelor's was a pro forma thing, 
I'd been specifically asked to submit what I wanted and why, which from Sable and Indira, I knew wasn't the normal request, but it was their game. Being a Merlin meant I owed the draft a decade of service. They wanted me now, but they also wanted me to have a degree to make sure I could use my magic properly. I felt like a blasted broodmare or something. All anyone cared about was what they could get out of me. At least they didn't make me serve a decade for each Merlin rank. See? Positive thoughts. It didn't help. Just made me more frustrated. Are you sulking for a reason? Carolian's voice pulled me out of my funk. Banyarl had taught us how to talk to him telepathically. I could do it easily, always had been able to. That was part of the familiar bond. Joe and Sable could talk to him, also, if they concentrated. But that was because he assisted them. I could send thoughts to them, but they couldn't respond. Banyarl promised eventually we'd all be able to speak this way but it took time for the brain to learn how to compose thoughts. While strong spirit mages could read minds, in general, mind speak was like talking. You had to think to send your words to someone else. And that took practice without the familiar bond. Yes, no, I don't know. Just tired of this. I want my own life, damn it. I managed to mutter that even in mind speech, which told me how much I was whining. Carolian snorted and put his head down, wrapping his long tail around him. No such thing. Stop wasting time whining about what is out of your control. Do something useful. His comment just made me sulk more, and I stood up, needing to move. I walked over to stare out the window. The envelope still in my hand. It was thick and felt like more than one piece of paper. Some comfort you are. My job is to provoke and guide you, not feed pity. Joe, come kick Cory in the hind end. He resembled a ruby statue at this point, with his tail so tight around him, it appeared seamless. I heard laughter from down the hall, and Joe walked out, followed by Sable. Kaylian said I need to come kick your ass. Is there a specific reason or direction I should kick it? She grinned as she flopped onto our futon couch, pulling Sable down beside her. Sable wore her naturally curly hair in ringlets she twisted together in different patterns, and her black hair provided a contrast to her dark latte-colored skin. With all the outside running Joe had been doing, she was darker than Sable was, even though Sable had an African-American father and a Japanese mother. The thought that she never talked about her mom flitted through my head, but I let it go to answer the question. He's grousing at me because I'm moping, which I know is stupid, but ugh, why can't they go away? Joe and Sable exchanged glances and then shrugged. I hate to say this, Corey, Sable said, a touch of sympathy in her voice, but they aren't going to. I sighed having expected and dreaded that answer. But Sable kept talking. You are double Merlin. Have a familiar that is almost instantly recognizable, not to mention impressive as hell. And you have an inheritance that multiple governments are drooling over. Frankly, if you get to live your own life before you turn 40, I'll be surprised. I growled, sounding suspiciously like my familiar who yawned at me, showing off two-inch teeth then went back into his statue impression. You're no help. I knew I was whining, but at this point I'd done over four years of doubling down on classes, and it looked like I still had another three to go if I got a doctorate. I'd been sure that by now I'd have a job, a place of my own, that I'd be living my own life, and not having anyone else telling me what to do. Nope, but lying to you is stupid. Corey, the price of being a mage means you owe something to the society. You know that. You've taken the same history classes as I have, and you know about some of the atrocities that have happened. Jonestown? Sable's voice was dry, and I sank back in the chair, shivering a bit. Jonestown was infamous. In magic history, there was a mandatory ten-page research paper that all students had to write. 
The OMO and the draft board used those papers as a litmus to make sure mages had ethics. Anyone who could condone what he did, how he did it, wasn't anyone you wanted to have power. All the information Stephen and Indira had dropped told me that mages regarded as dangerous ended up dead very fast. After two years, I could finally think of Agent Stephen Alexant as Stephen, but it still caused a stab of pain, saying my dead brother's name, and not having him here. Plus, I still had years before Christos, my younger brother, would be given the option to find me. I'd been surprised when Stephen told me to watch and see if anyone disappeared after discussing that paper. Someone had. A student I recognized, but didn't actually know. I found his name later on a list of obituaries for the school. That had dismissed any questions I had about how carefully people watched mages. Mages and non-mages would always be treated differently, until everyone was equal, or at least everyone had magic. And to think most people thought mages had it easy. Maybe money-wise we did, but we had much less freedom than the average person. Do you really think they are going to let you, a double Merlin, out without anything less than iron control? Sable's voice was unsympathetic, and I didn't blame her. No, I responded. They've retested a lot of people, even if they didn't want to be retested. Stephen mentioned they'd only found three more that may have emerged twice, though currently they think the original rating was wrong and are blaming machine or operator error. None of them were Merlins. Most of the older mages are avoiding the retesting at all cost, which means I'm still unique. I shrugged. Getting tested twice just complicated your life. So, sink into it. Enjoy it. Make the most out of it. Grousing around won't change it, so find ways to enjoy. You met the first step of the requirements. The rest should be much easier than that. Joe gestured at the envelope I still held. So, open it already. I want to know about the house. Assuming that is about the house. Yes, the house. The reason I'd fought so hard to pull this off. But after 18 months, I was scared to look. What if it was now a rundown shack? More accurately, a rundown mansion. The picture could have been from 30 years ago. A spirit Merlin had left me a ton of stuff if I met the requirements for inheriting. The problem was, he thought I was a decade older than I was. Meeting that first requirement of getting my degree by the deadline almost killed me. But I had that piece of paper now. Everything else should be downhill. Start my draft, finish my draft. Though survive my draft might be more accurate, especially if I didn't get my head in the game. Sample's right. Quit moping and see what there is to enjoy about this. You can't change it, but you can still be who you want to be, right? It just felt like I'd been fighting the establishment forever. And for what? That was the problem. I didn't know. And even more, I didn't know if I wanted to keep fighting. Corey, Joe prompted, and I shook my head. My hair reached my butt, and after a decade of wearing it at shoulder length, the weight distracted me and felt wrong. I was tempted to cut it, but that would just highlight that I could use offerings no longer part of my body. Sorry, guess I'm in a funk. Not sure why. I admitted, as the truth of those words sung through me. The laughter from Joe and Sable caught me off guard. What? My throat tightened, and all the doubts stored up in my mind cascaded down on me again. I fought to control my desire to throw things. Carolyn only flicked an ear at me, not saying anything. Corey, my dearest, Joe started, her pitying smile plastered on her face. I narrowed my eyes at her and I saw Joe fighting to keep the look cemented, but she choked on a laugh. Sable rolled her eyes and shoulder nudged Joe. Corey, Sable said. You've been working nonstop since Japan settled all the lawsuits. If you aren't in class, you're studying. If you aren't studying, you're working. If you're not working, you're in class. I don't think you've taken more than Christmas Eve and a day off since it happened. You've even worked Thanksgiving. You're burned out, exhausted, and you're taking this summer off. She sent a stern look at me. Wait, what? No, I need... I started to say. 
I needed to work, take some more summer classes to lower my course load next year, and there was a second degree that I could get with a few more credit hours. You need a vacation, Joe interrupted my protests. And a trip to see the house you killed yourself earning sounds like exactly the right thing to do. Now, open the damn envelope, see what it is. But either way, we are headed to New York to see your house. Her glare held love, but she also wasn't going to give. When she got stubborn, Joe got stubborn. Fine, fine. I lifted both hands in the air, surrendering. As I did so, the back of the envelope caught my eye, and I pulled it down to pay attention to it. I'd been mostly avoiding it, aware of the grenade-like quality, but refusing to examine what shrapnel it might contain. In script matching the font, the flap of the envelope had a name and address on it. Lucille Blanding. The address didn't match where the house was, but it was in New York. I'd expected it to be from the lawyer David Carlson. He'd checked in once a semester to see if I was on schedule, but nothing else. With a shrug, I opened it, exhibiting a bit more care than I usually did. I peeled open the envelope, and a small sheaf of paper slid out. There were two pictures inside, also. I looked at the pictures first. It showed two people standing in front of a house. My house. The lines of it called to me, and I had to fight to pay attention to the two people. They looked young in their 20s, possibly early 30s. The man was clean-shaven with a thick head of dark brown hair, wearing an out-of-style suit. The woman next to him had brilliant red hair. It almost matched Carolyn's coat. The suit dress she wore could have been worn today and no one would have even blinked. They were leaning on the porch columns, and I could see the spirit Merlin tattoo on his face, but she didn't have one. I flipped it over, and on the back was a date, about 40 years ago, and two names, Lucille Blanding, James Wells. Huh, so that's what he looked like. I handed over the picture to Joe and Sable, who had managed not to grab things out of my hands, They looked like two little kids waiting for their piece of candy. Mmm, who's the liquor? His wife? Joe asked, and I glanced back at her. The woman in the photo had been pretty, but the fierceness of her grin caught my attention more. No clue. I looked at the second photo. This picture was of the house, and was obviously pretty recent. It matched the one from the will. Built in the Victorian style, it had a wraparound porch, and an octagonal structure on one side of the house. I stared at it until Joe cleared her throat. Patience, you have none, I said, handing her the photo, then opening the letter. Chapter 2 Merlin seemed to love research and hiding in their homes. While it is not true that all Merlins are rich, the majority tend to be well off if they manage their money wisely. As to the idea of most Merlins becoming reclusive researchers, it has become a conceit exploited by anyone trying to spin a story. Magic Explained Online Miss Corsan Monroe, let me introduce myself. I am Lucille Blanding, estate manager for the James Wells estate. Per my records, you should be receiving this letter after you have had your degree for seven days. At the time of writing this missive, I still have not heard from you in regard to the house. As this property is now your responsibility, I expect to see you within three days of receipt of this letter. If you decide to drive up, it should be four days. I will be expecting your phone call so we can meet and go over all the aspects involved in managing the house, as well as the expectations involved from other parties. Included are pictures of the house, both when it was originally purchased by James and myself, and the most recent as of two years ago. Included are requests for access from various groups in the last month. Until May of last year, the Emperor of Japan was insistent that his royal magician be granted access. I believe you have insight as to the reasons those requests ceased. Review the requests and decide how you would like to handle them. I await your call. Her name, signature, and an address and phone number followed, as well as the address of the house. I'd registered New York when I looked at the inheritance stuff, but now the city of Albany jumped out at me. 
I'm impressed at the attitude and vaguely offended, but I can't say any of her information is wrong. I handed over the letter, then looked at the other pieces of paper in the sheaf. They were all addressed to Lucille, but specifically mentioned research notes located in the house and requests to study objects suspected to be located in his house. To each letter was attached a note listing the times and the reasons they had been denied. The text on the notes was abrupt. Unable to verify existence slash location of requested object. Ask later. Notes cannot be cataloged until inheritor arrives. Ask then. At this time, there is no access to the house being provided. Be aware the house has its own defenses and is perfectly capable of disposing of trespassers. I snorted at that note. How did a house dispose of trespassers? The idea of a self-aware house raised even more questions. I handed the notes over to Joe as well, but Sable was on her phone typing furiously. That got a raised eyebrow from me. She'd been just as interested in what the letter held as Joe. Before I could ask, she grinned and lifted brown eyes to meet mine. Got it. It should take us about 15 hours to drive up there, so about two days. But Dad has a friend with a house in Bel Air, Maryland, we can crash at. If we pack tonight, we can be on the road tomorrow and at your house the next day. My draft doesn't start for another six weeks, and you and Joe can afford to take a week or two off. I started to protest. I should work this summer, build up my cash reserves, keep my skills up, and sleep. That whispered thought brought a sense of longing. I couldn't remember the last time I had slept past eight. Nope. Joe cut off my protests. A road trip sounds delightful. I've never been any further than North Carolina, and we have to go to New York City. I want to see the house, and we all deserve a bit of celebrating. We've all been working hard these last few months. That I couldn't argue with. Even with severe dyslexia, Joe had raised her GPA to a 3.8. Sable and I both worked our butts off to keep a 4.0. But with graduation, the mandatory mage draft would kick in. Mages between magician and archmage owed four years. Merlin's owed a decade. But since she had her master's, the draft would pull her up soon. And we still needed to discuss where she might be placed. It could be any place in the world that the U.S. had a presence. I bit my lip. I'd never been out of the state. A road trip sounded like freedom in a way I hadn't expected. I glanced down at Carolyn. What do you think? He opened one eye to look at me. I want a hammock in the back. Joe and Sable snickered, so I knew he'd shared that with them. We'd been watching a show, and it had shown a hammock in the back of a hatchback with a cat laying in it watching the world go by. He thought that looked awesome. That hammock had been supported by suction cups, though. I doubted suction cups would support him since he weighed at least ten times what the average cat did. I'll see what I can do, Sable said, trying to muffle her laughs. Joe only owned a motorcycle, and while I had my license, getting a car was an expense I didn't need. Sable, however, had a car, and it was a hatchback meaning he could watch the world go by around him. Then we should leave. There is much of the world I would like to see, explore, hunt. We all rolled our eyes at that. He'd never been much for cat toys, but he loved to terrorize the squirrels and birds, though had never killed any that I knew of. The only live food he ate with any regularity were mice from the pet store, and those were solely as treats. He said his favorite food was fish, which I guess was a delicacy. I needed to remember to buy some salmon and take it to Esmir, his mother, or Malkin in cath language, next time I went to the spirit realm. Will Banyarl be able to reach us in New York? I asked. As far as Banyarl, our griffin teacher, was concerned, we still had another decade of training to be able to utilize our skills fully. He'd likened it to the fact that we now knew how to build a table and that we could put a flat piece of wood down and attach legs. But we had a long way to go to create a table worthy of royalty. His eyes closed. Carolyn flicked one ear towards me. He can find you wherever you are. The planes are not attached to your realm in any manner that I can explain. Oh, I muttered. Nothing like having a cat or Kath, 
point out the obvious. I focused on the scenery of our road trip. I could see some states explore the world. Getting out of here and away from Atlanta for a while might be something healthy for all of us. I turned and pulled up my bank account online and checked it. I'd been good about the money I'd earned, and the government stipends helped. With Joe and Sable paying for the majority of the bills, it meant I still had a good bit of savings. I could take a week, maybe two, off and have some fun. Fun. I didn't know if I knew how to have fun anymore. Corey, we are going. We all need this. And frankly, you and Sable deserve to have some sort of celebration. Getting a degree is a big deal. And with the grades you two have, it's an even bigger deal. We'll see some sights and enjoy the trip. Did she give you an email address? I double-checked, then shook my head. Just the number. We'll call her. Tell her we are driving up but are making a road trip of it, and we'll be there in a few days. We can pack up and head out. I'll call my parents, and then we can bow to Sebel as to where to stay. I gave in. The idea of a break, a vacation, and a road trip with my best friend and her girlfriend sounded like something fun and in my control. Okay, let's do it. The words rang in the air. Then Joe whooped and sprang from the couch. Yes, road trip, let's get packing. Joe headed off, pulling out her phone as she did so, and Sable grinned at me. This is going to be so much fun. I can't wait. Sable didn't squeal, not quite, but the grin she gave me shared her excitement, and for a minute, I felt guilty. I'd been so focused and determined to get this degree by the due date, and they'd done everything to help me. Right then, I knew I had to make this vacation one they'd never forget. I called the number listed. You've reached Lucille Blanding. Please state the reason for your call and a number where you can be reached. If I feel it necessary, I will call you back. There was a long beep. Um, hey, this is Corey Monroe. I'm driving up with my friends, but we are going to take a few days and make a road trip. We should be there Friday afternoon. Call me, I guess, if you need to. I left my number and hung up. Joe was already packing, and Sable was talking to her dad letting him know we were headed that way, and asking if his friend could host us for a night. That made me realize I should let my mentors know. I'd been pressured by the government to have extra protection and guidance when the Emperor of Japan had sanctioned a bounty on my life. Stephen Alexand, FBI agent and Indira Humbert, my teacher, an unreliable friend, had offered to mentor me. I'd given in and signed a contract with them. The idea of mentors was very middle ages, but they'd bent over backwards to give me as much leeway as possible. I still felt like a mule with five different people trying to tug me in multiple directions. My mentors were two of them, and their goals, even if they were dating, weren't always the same. Either way, I needed to keep them in the loop. I texted Alexin and Indira. I was getting better at thinking of him as Steven, but Alexin was still easier. Stephen still reminded me too much of my twin brother and his death in my arms. Alexant would probably always be easier for me. Hey, headed up to New York to see the house. Be gone a week or so. See you when I get back. With that, I shoved my phone in my pocket and started on my portion of the list Sable was creating on our whiteboard. The next five hours were a blur of packing, calling, arranging to have our apartment looked after, and figuring out how to make the hammock that my familiar overlord demanded. He, of course, watched all of us from a huge cat perch wedged in the corner of our apartment, making comments and verifying we remembered his harness and his favorite food. By the time we fell into bed, we were ready to start on an adventure, complete with a cat hammock rated for over a 100 pounds. Chapter 3. The draft isn't servitude. It is a framework for the responsibility of a mage. The best way to make sure they understand the power gifted to them is through education and training. While college educates, it is incumbent upon the government to ensure the training and consequences for letting their magic slip past the confines of societal mores is clear. 
OMO statement to the UN. All of us, Joe, Sable, Caroline, and I, had a blast on the drive up. The mountains were gorgeous in midsummer, and we stopped at half of the roadside attractions, getting to see historical and local sites, eating out at places we didn't have at home, and that catered to familiars, and just not being in Georgia sent a rejuvenating wave through me. At the end of the first day, we crashed at a hotel about six hours from Atlanta, though with traffic and detours, it had taken us 10 hours. We were having too much fun eating, laughing, and just not thinking about classwork to worry about time. Joe usually drove, while Sable took the passenger seat. I sat in the back, watching the scenery. The billboards on the sides of the road advertised everything, from adult toy stores, strippers, and peaches to pecans. The things they tried to seduce passing cars with never failed to amuse me. What is adult entertainment, and why do you want live girls? Caroline asked as we left the Carolinas and headed up the East Coast. The billboards pushing sex as entertainment had been plentiful. Joe and Sable joined in with my laughter. Joe managed to speak first. It's advertising sexual films and naked women dancing for your entertainment. Want to go, Sable? I can guarantee you're sexier than any of them. Sable choked on her own giggles. (laughs) Thanks, but no. I'll live without having to stare at some strange woman's tits. I didn't have to see her to know she was smirking. I laughed, then paused as something registered in my brain. Carolyn? I asked slowly. I could mind speak, that much Banyarl had made sure of. But with the four of us, I usually spoke out loud as neither Joe nor Sable could mind speak back to me. Yes. He sounded zenned out as he swayed in the back of Sable's car, the suitcases tucked under him. I suspected the hammock would become a permanent fixture anywhere we went. Since when can you read? The sound of old musicals filling the car, courtesy of Sable's addiction, stopped. I could see Sable turned in her seat, looking back as I twisted to stare at Carolyn. His tail stopped twitching, and his lazy motion ceased. An, oh shit, silence filled the car before he sighed in our minds. Ugh, for a while? Seeing the tiny print in your books or on the monitors is difficult, but the signs in anything large I can read easy enough. I processed that information. It didn't really make a difference, but the ability to read could change everything. Familiars were cataloged as less than human, but more than animals. If it became public knowledge, who knew what the ramifications would be? Can all familiars read? Most of us. Depends on our eyes. But this isn't anything that needs to be spread around. My Malkin will be most displeased with me. He sounded dejected, his ears laying back against his skull, while his tail twitched in a staccato pattern. The body language reminded me that he was still under two years old, even by Kath's standards, not even a teenager. I won't tell her if you don't, Not like it comes up much. And since you can't really see our books, I don't suppose you want stuff to read? No. I can read and understand most of what I read, though sometimes the sounds don't match what I expect. But Kath don't use written language. Most of the realm's denizens don't. Even with thumbs, writing isn't practical. Our memory suffices. He extended the claws on his front paw as he spoke starting to groom, and waggled said thumb at us. Thumbs meant he could open doors, and even operate a can opener if he wanted, though he preferred to be served, and mostly it hadn't been a worry. I really need to quit thinking of him as less than me. He isn't. He's not human. That doesn't mean he's stupid. Good to know, I guess. If I ever need to leave you a note, I'll make sure it's in really big letters, I said, smirking at him. He flicked an ear at me. Not amusing. You can speak to me from almost anywhere. I can? We never tested distance or range. I knew I could contact him at the apartment from anywhere on campus, 
but I couldn't remember ever trying to talk to him any farther out than that. He paused and lifted his head to look at me. This time, the voice in my head changed, becoming deeper and more contained, indicating he spoke only to me. That is a good question. We should test. Yes, that might be good. I had more than one scare when Japan was trying to kill me. We did need to test the range since I'd gotten better at speaking to him. We both let the subject drop, and music filled the car again. This time from Pirates of Penzance. Sable started singing along with, I am the very model of a modern major general, making Joe and me fall apart in laughter as she danced in her seat, keeping time with her hands. The rest of the trip flew by too fast. The home in Bel Air belonging to the old friend of Sable's dad was nice. They let us bunk down in his grown kid's room. Their kids had all gone to college a few years ago, and there was plenty of space. They fed us and made us feel welcome. It was odd thinking that most families were more like this than mine. That made me think of Christos, my younger brother. But I still had at least seven years before he'd be provided the information to contact me. Someday, I'd get to know my brother. But it wouldn't be until both of us were grown. Just one more thing in my life that was hurry up and wait. After a huge breakfast the next morning, featuring the best omelet I'd ever had, we left offering our heartfelt thanks. Sable promised her dad would come by for a weekend to reminisce with his old friend. Piling back in the car, we started the last part of our trip, and I almost hated to have it end, but all of us were ready to be out of the car for a while. We made good time and arrived around 11 a.m. The road turned into a private lane, and we drew in a shocked breath at the three houses. The will had mentioned these properties— They would become mine when I finished serving the draft. The house we were looking for sat at the end of the dead-end road, but the other houses we drove by snagged our attention. The road had to be close to a mile long, and while we may have been in Albany, we were at least 20 minutes from the city proper. Each house sat on at least five acres, if not more. To our left was a two-story craftsman. My Victorian hovered at the end of the lane, and the Tudor mansion sprawled out on our right. I would have expected the Victorian or the craftsman to sell for well over half a million, and the Tudor mansion for a million plus. Damn, and you own these? Joe didn't quite whisper, but her voice held reverence and shock. I completely understood her reaction. The pictures hadn't conveyed these houses properly. Well, not now. Just the Victorian at the end, but in theory, someday, yes. I need to remember to make a will. The thought brought a chill to my joy, and some of the heat of the day fled. We continued our slow drive, admiring the houses. That one? That's the one I want. You love me, Corey, and will give me my own house? Joe was half teasing, half serious, as she pointed at the tutor she'd fallen for, back when we had examined the contents of the will. I snorted. (laughs) If I make it through the draft, it's yours. What in the world am I going to do with all of these? Both of the houses had cars parked in the driveways, while one, the craftsman, had toys on the lawn. Maybe they were being rented out. I looked at the paperwork 18 months ago, when the inheritance thing was dropped on me, but I put the documents away after I decided to get my degree, in the time required. Now, my lack of information was coming back to nip at my heels. The house from the photos sat at the end. Driving up to it, I fell in love all over again. Victorian in feel, it had been recently painted, and maroon trim and gray siding popped in the summer sun. A sleek silver jaguar lounged in the driveway. A detached two-car garage at the right of the building had a covered walkway between it and the house. The wide driveway, big enough for two cars side by side, had a path leading to the front door. I slid out of the back seat, holding the door open for Carolyn. Once he jumped out, I felt drawn to the house, 
and moved a few steps up the walk. The front door to the house opened, and a woman stepped out. Shadowed by the porch roof, all I could make out was the outline of her figure. I headed up the walkway, doors shutting behind me and Carolyn at my side, but I stayed focused on her. The porch cried out for a bench swing where I could curl up, drink sweet tea, and read. It wrapped around the left side of the house, out of sight. It needed some plants and a new coat of paint, but I knew I could transform it into a refuge from the heat of summer. As I headed up the walkway, the form stepped to the top of the three steps going up to the porch. The light bounced off her hair, still a vibrant orange red, though now cut in a sharp, sleek bob. Dressed in exquisitely tailored slacks and suit jacket, she looked powerful and elegant. I felt oddly underdressed in my shorts and tank top. Her sharp, light brown eyes traveled over each of us as she waited, hands clasped in front of her. I'd never gone to a Catholic school, but suddenly I felt like a wayward student called before a nun. This woman was intimidating in exactly that way. Joe shifted beside me, and Sable nudged me from behind. I took a deep breath, then forced a smile on my face, and took one step forward, toes touching the bottom step. Hi, I'm Corey. You must be Lucille. Hmm. The sound indicated nothing, but her eyes let me know I'd been found wanting. Yes, I'm Lucille Blanding. About time you arrived. Come in. I don't have all day. Her voice was abrupt and professional as she spun on her incongruent tennis shoes and walked back inside. I glanced back at the others, but the traders shrugged and waved me forward. I resisted the urge to make faces at them and headed up the stairs, following Lucille. The details on the door, the burnished wood on the porch railing, everything about the house made me want to investigate every detail. The banister on the porch had leaves worked into it, making it appear to have grown across the top. Approaching the entryway, the sense of dust and decay assaulted my nostrils, and I wrinkled my nose. As I stepped fully across the threshold, a wave of magic hit me, and I gasped. It felt similar to my magical emergence, but softer. A caress instead of a slap. It poked and prodded, and I felt like it asked a question but I didn't know what the question was. I see the house has sensed you, Lucille remarked as she moved towards the entryway table. I looked around confused by the magic and the dusty smell. The house looked clean, but the inside needed a good airing out. It felt, and smelled, stale and unused. Accurate, probably. Lucille stood near the entry table that held a pile of papers, multiple keys, and a purse. I was beginning to think I'd have to issue a subpoena to get you here. She glanced up at me, then shook her head. The young have no sense of time, though I suppose I never realized I'd be taking on this responsibility for a decade when James died. Joe and Sable had followed me in, talking softly behind me. I stood, antsy with a hunger to examine my house. My house? The phrase made me smile. I had a house. I wanted to dance for joy, but I restrained myself and looked around. There was a sitting room to our right and another room, maybe dining, to our left. The wallpaper in the entry was a pale green with small vines and leaves twisting through it. I couldn't get close enough to see more than that. What did you mean the house sensed me? Lucille lifted her left shoulder in a dismissive gesture. The house isn't normal. It has its own presence and magic, though I'm not sure how. Lucille replied, There is the deed. You just need to sign it. This is the acknowledgement of accepting all the responsibility for the house and removing it from the standard trust which I manage. She pointed to the signature line on the paper. I have here a list of requests received for items believed to be in the house. After you have had a chance to review them, we can discuss what you'd like to do regarding their requests. My suggestion is to ignore them until you complete your draft and own everything. 
That way, you will have all the information necessary to make informed decisions. Joe spoke while I read. Believed to be? Lucille slanted her eyes towards Joe, and I bristled as Joe flushed. But Joe stood up straighter and looked back at Lucille, her expression challenging. Lucille smirked and shifted her eyes back to me, waiting for me to finish. I read the paper carefully once more, but it simply confirmed the transfer of the property and all assets that go with it into my name. I signed my name, with a sensation of electric excitement rippling through me. Lucille checked my signature and nodded. Excellent. Here are the keys to the property. She took a breath, her body tense, and held out the keys. I reached for them, something striking me as odd about her behavior. Before I could grab the keys, she let go. I caught the jangling mess of brass and iron as it fell, and the world disappeared. Chapter 4 What we know about magic is nothing compared to what we don't know. Humanity has studied magic for barely 150 years, and most of those years have been spent in guesswork and failed experiments. Never forget for a minute, the offering you provide is based on decades of people risking their lives. Live by the rules we teach you, and maybe you'll live to be where I am today. G.A. Magtech, Commencement Speaker Chaos Merlin Osman Jones I spun, my heart pounding. Joe, Sable, even the house had disappeared, leaving me in a formless gray space. Joe? Carolian? I called out, trying to see anything. I could see myself just fine, but there wasn't anything else there. Even my voice sounded vaguely muffled, as if the area around me absorbed sound. The only constants were the sounds of my breathing and my heart beating. Otherwise, silence shrouded everything. Where the hell am I? What happened? Panicking sounded really good, but it never helped. I knew that all too well. I took a deep breath and closed my eyes. The air or atmosphere around me felt cool, barely, so probably in the high 70s. My hair didn't move, and there was no breeze. The ring of keys was clenched in my hand, but I could sense very little else. I was wearing sandals, and the surface underneath me seemed firm, but that was all I could tell. I knelt and pressed against the ground. It existed, but I couldn't tell if it was soft or hard, lumpy or smooth. Just there. This isn't real. The gray around me swallowed my words. It is, and it isn't. I spun, looking for a voice, but there was no one there. The voice came from everywhere and nowhere. Why am I here? I had a dozen other questions, but that seemed most important. Why are you here? My brows scrunched together. That's what I asked. You do not know? I couldn't tell if the voice was masculine or feminine. Heck, I couldn't be sure if it was speaking out loud and not in my head. There was no accent and just a hint of some emotion in it. Not a computer, but something not human? That made me reassess the environment. I forced myself to take a deep breath. I could feel my lungs expand, but I didn't feel the sensation of air entering. This is all in my mind. This is occurring by magic. So why did you take me? You were not taken. You accepted. This is test one. I accepted? My hands clenched and the keys bit into my palm. The pain pulled me back from my confusion. A test? Are you the house? The only thing I had accepted was the house. Magic had washed through me when I walked over the threshold. But who had a magical house? Magic didn't work that way, at least not for humans. In a way. Go on. Prove how mighty you are. Banish me. I blinked. Banish it? How? With what? Is it crazy? Thank you, but no. I replied, shaking my head. 
No? This time there was amusement. Well, I'm not excited about being kidnapped. I doubt that killing you is the answer. Ah, you would kill me then. Didn't I just say that wasn't the answer? And yes, I get there are multiple interpretations to the word banish, but I'm not an exorcist, and I doubt kicking you to another realm is the right answer. So, no. I'd rather figure out what you want, and maybe we can... What could I do? I didn't want to compromise, as I hadn't asked for whatever this test was. What did I want? Maybe we can what? There seemed to be a bit of curiosity, as well as amusement this time. I tamped down my temper. Snarking off to an unknown being wasn't the wisest move. Even if I was getting seriously annoyed, at least I wasn't scared anymore. Why don't you tell me what you want, and I'll figure it out? An odd silence filled the area, different than what I'd heard at first. I could almost hear the voice thinking. Do magic for me. On what? For what? To prove I what? I would have started throwing things, but there wasn't anything to throw. To show me you know how to use it. The voice had lost all emotion, and now sounded almost alien. Um, okay. I muttered, looking around, hoping to find something, anything. But there was nothing there. Magic worked best affecting things. Fire or lightning were the only showy ones. Ah, I can do that. Even after all this time, Indira's class still helps me. I rubbed my hands briskly on my shorts to generate some friction. Then, in this space that I wasn't even sure existed, I called lightning, planning on arcing it up and away from my hands. The offering was so tiny, a single strand of hair, that I was hoping for a small arc, a little bit of brightness and the smell of ozone in the air. What I got was a bolt as thick as my wrist that streamed from my hand as if I was Zeus hurling lightning bolts. Merlin's balls! I jerked backwards, cutting off the flow as soon as my reaction could manage. What was that? My calm fled like water on a red-hot skillet, and I felt like I'd been dumped into the fire. Magic. An impressive use. What else can you do? Why do you care? I want to go back. Are my friends okay? I hadn't dared ask that, but that bolt had scared ten years off my life. Only you are here. They are where they belong. That didn't make me feel much better. What do you want? A figure came walking out of the mists, humanoid in shape, but I couldn't make out any features, or even if it was male or female. It blended with the grayness as it stalked around me. Fight me. Why? I don't want to fight you. My protest was heartfelt. Just because I'd learned how to use magic as a weapon didn't mean I liked using it that way. Weaponizing magic seemed to sully it, and I couldn't explain why, other than the low-level reverence Banyarl and Esmir had for magic. Their discomfort for how we'd reduced it all to science played into part of my feelings. You don't want to prove you're better than me? Um, no. Because I don't know that I'm better than you. Heck, I think the only thing I'd win on is having weirder things happen to me. Like this! I exclaimed as I waved my arms around. The figure stopped and moved a bit closer. I still couldn't make out details, other than rather willowy, with long limbs. You are a peculiar one. No challenging me. No threats. No begging. They usually do all three. I threw up my hands, swallowing a scream. Why? Would it do any good? If you can bring me here, I doubt I want to fight you. But I also don't know if I want someone that would do this as my friend. So again, I ask, what do you want from me? The being tilted its head one way, then the other, as if peering at me from multiple angles. Friend, that option hasn't been chosen ever. How interesting. I didn't know what to make of that answer, so I went with it. So, you want to come over for lunch sometime? 
meet Joe, Carolyn, and Sable? Be social? And not this? I waved my hands between us. Laughter, pure and somehow shocking in its crystal clarity, burst out. <laughs> Fascinating! It giggled. At this time, no. There is temptation to try something you call cake. There is one final test before you are returned. I tried to sigh and swallow at the same time, and ended up choking on the knowledge it knew about Tersane and her interest in me. Tersane, the Gorgon demigoddess of spirit, powerful, terrifying, a friend of Banyarl and Esmir, and she had enjoyed eating cake at my birthday party. Just thinking about her made the two green dots on my wrist ache, markers of where one of her snakes had bitten me. I reached up to touch my necklace, a spirit symbol charm Joe had given me for my birthday, backed with the scale Tersane had broken off her body, a scale that would get me one favor, and something I planned on never needing to use. I finished hacking up a lung and got my heart rate under control. Once again, I made a horrible first impression. Only me. Please set this on fire. Use as much or as little offering as you feel comfortable giving. An object appeared about five feet in front of me, looking like a strange obelisk, but at first glance, I couldn't tell what it was made of. I froze, suspicious. How much would it take? Fire remained a knoll, and I didn't have Carolyn with me to help lower the cost. I had avoided playing with it since the first time. It seemed too wild. And I had other things to do besides advertise that I could do the impossible. But on the other hand, if it got me out of here... Okay, I said, trying to sound confident. I wasn't. Oh well, if Joe can go bald, so can I. I took a breath and called for fire seeking it in me, the area around me, and the object itself. There didn't seem to be much there. Even air, though I could breathe, seemed absent. Hard way it is. I dug in my shorts and pulled out a receipt from the gas station we'd stopped at. We'd all needed to pee, and I wanted a Coke. I walked over to the object. It was about six feet tall, and I couldn't tell what it was made of. Stone? Metal? Nothing? I learned how to identify elements, and I tried it now. But nothing resonated with the ones I'd learned. Transformation mages learned more of them than I did. It isn't radioactive, is it? I asked, my voice squeaking as I took a big step back. No, I would not allow such poison into my domain. The voice sounded colder than the emptiness of space, and I hoped it was right. I shook my head at my own paranoia and put the piece of paper on the top of it and backed away. Here goes nothing. I set the paper on fire the hard way, making the molecules move faster until the paper combusted in a bright red-yellow burst of hunger. That cost me a fraction of an inch around the ends of my hair. Mages had to offer up their genetic material to use magic. A quarter inch of hair wasn't much for someone with a knoll and fire, First step done. I moved to the next and called fire. I have tasty offerings for you. Will you eat the object you sit on? I sing-songed the words so low I could barely hear them, but intent was what mattered. I learned through training with Baneural that fire was always hungry. Fire possessed a need for sustenance that could never be quenched. It worked better if I talked to it about food than anything else. The fire, or magic depending on how you looked at it, questioned me. It wasn't the normal query. From my experience, and talking with Joe and Sable showed me everyone experienced it differently, they would present a cost, and I'd agree or disagree. This time it sent what seemed like a question, asking if I was sure I wanted to do that. It felt like getting an arched eyebrow from Joe when she looked at one of my cooking failures. I sent back an affirmative. There was the sensation of a sigh and an amount. I choked, but replied affirmative. Five inches of hair vaporized, and the obelisk was wrapped in incandescent flames and liquefied. 
The substance rippled through black to silver to a titanium rainbow. It was a cooling puddle of metal as the fire winked out of existence, with the sensation of satiation caressing across my mind. Um, sorry? I muttered it as I stepped back from the melted puddle. I didn't know you could do that. My head felt oddly light, and I would need to remember to keep up the vitamins. That is unexpected. The misty figure stood, and it seemed to be focused on the cooling liquid. This will be difficult to explain. It paused, then looked at me, and I froze, feeling like a mouse before Carolyn ate it. You are not expected, but maybe that is for the best. Go. You shall prove interesting. A rush of air hit me in the face, and I blinked, the front hall of the house resolving with Joe, Sable, and Lucille all staring at me. Corey, what just happened? You've been standing there frozen for almost a minute. Joe asked slowly, her gaze roving over me, as if making sure I was in one piece. At the same time, Carolyn's voice burst into my mind. Where were you? You left. Your body was here, but not you. Where did you go? He sounded frantic, and the sharpness cut through my brain like a whip. I pushed all that down and focused on Lucille, who had pursed lips with her brows drawn together. What was that? Did you know that would happen? I saw Joe and Sable jerk their heads, checking out Lucille. Carolyn rubbed against my leg with a worried purr. Lucille lifted her right hand up and waggled it a bit, making her silver ring reflect the light. I suspected something might happen. James left very explicit instructions to hand over the keys after the transfer was signed, and to make sure I didn't touch them when the new Merlin did. He mentioned something about the house judging the worth of his heir. Corey, what happened? Joe prodded, coming over and peering at me. And what happened to your hair? It's shorter. It was long a moment ago. I reached for my hair, and sure enough, the five inches of offering had been accepted. It wasn't all in my mind. Wait, how long was I frozen? Joe and Sable glanced at each other, then back at me. Maybe a minute? You caught the keys and just jerked. We waited for you to say something. You were standing there with a blank expression on your face. We called your name a few times, but you didn't react. I was about to grab you and shake you when some of your hair vaporized and you took a breath and blinked. Joe finished, still frowning at me. Okay, I drawled out. I thought I was in there for at least 15 minutes, maybe longer. Corey! Joe exclaimed, exasperation in her voice. Oh, yeah, so... I explained the weirdness, and even Carolyn listened with rapt attention. What did that mean? Who was it? Sable asked when I finished, but I looked at Lucille for that answer. I don't know. Lucille spoke in a matter-of-fact way. I know James said the house would verify, but he never mentioned anything like that, though he may not have known. Of the houses on the street... This is the only one that has refused to let anyone live in it. People walk in and instantly leave. The rest are just houses, not this one. What does that mean? Sable must have read my mind because I wanted to know that too. A quirk of Lucille's mouth softened her features for a moment. Then it was gone, leaving the sharp woman watching us. It means most people won't even walk into the house. They reach the steps and find a reason to turn around. I tried to rent it out for years, but gave up. A cleaner comes in and dusts and vacuums the rooms they can enter, and the rest, well, they are yours. Her smile wasn't reassuring. Now, to finish up business, and I will be on my way. As I was saying, there are certain rooms that won't open. I advise, if they don't unlock... Then you aren't ready to go in there, or the room isn't ready to let you in. There are lists of items James said were present, but I haven't ever verified. When he died, I didn't worry about it. I simply closed the house up. Wait, rooms that won't let you in? 
How do you do that? Magic doesn't let you do that. I protested. A quick review of everything I knew about the magical branches reassured me none of them had talked about enchanting rooms. And I'm still stuck on the house has its own magic? Of course, given what just happened, I'm not sure I know anything. This time she sighed, exasperated. Ah, <sighs> if you figure that out, you can respond to request 33 and 44. No one knows how it did it, and I'm not a mage, as you can see. She tapped her tattoo-free temple. Now, the taxes for the estate were paid ahead of time for 20 years. You have nine before they are due. By then, your draft should almost be done. Yearly property taxes average 16000 a year, though by the time you finish the draft, you will have access to his accounts, and paying that should not be an issue. Chapter 5 The discussion of null branches, and if they are usable, remains a point of contention, while most argue that null is usable but the cost is too high, there have been reports that if you are an archmage or higher, the cost may be much less than previously thought. But here our training teaches mages to ignore their null branches, to such an extent that the opportunities to study this are overridden by belief that it is unusable. Magic Explained Online I choked at the amount of property tax due. 16000 a year? For taxes? Lucille leveled a hard stare at me, and I fought to not back up. In many ways, she was much more intimidating than the strange being in the gray area. After making me quail in my shoes, she let a smile peek through. Yes, New York State property tax isn't horrible. I would expect, after your draft... You will either have a substantial amount of savings or be able to get a job in the high six figures. If you are worried about money, once you start earning a regular paycheck, contact me and discuss investing. I'm in my office most weeks, and the utility bills are being transferred over to you starting next month. I eeped, terrified. The bills on this place must be insane. Suddenly, my dream house was becoming a nightmare. How in the world can I afford this? The familiar prickle of Murphy started to wrap around me, and I fought to dismiss it. It took me a full minute, and only Carolyn pressing against my leg, his fur soft yet prickly, helped me center enough to break the attraction. I was aware of the others standing there watching me, but Joe distracted Lucille until I managed. Don't have an anxiety attack yet. Lucille pointed to a checkbook. That is for the account that goes with this house. It is based off the rent earned by the other two houses on this street. Currently, both houses have long-term tenants, though they have been notified that any renewals may be optional a month after your draft officially ends. That answered that question and made me feel better. Even so, this gift might bite me in the ass. We need a cat door. The back area has excellent trees to lurk in. All of us, including Lucille, turned towards Carolyn, who had moved away from my leg, and sprawled out on the redwood floor, creating a picture-perfect image, which I strongly suspected he knew. Any changes you want to make to the house are up to you. The account has more than enough for most remodeling wishes. A flash of pain flickered onto her face, then was gone. If you decide to do massive remodeling, I would like to point out that there are multiple buyers that would purchase this house for cash, if you do not wish to retain it, including me, though for most you may be required to break the magic on the house. No, I protested. I have no desire to do massive remodeling. The door will figure out, but I think I like it the way it is. My voice trailed off a bit at that last part. So far, I'd seen the porch in the foyer. What if other rooms were ghastly or the kitchen looked like it still belonged in the 1800s? Her jaw was tight as she replied. Excellent, but please let me know if you decide this isn't for you. You do own it. Sign here. She tapped a piece of paper with a pen on it. And then I'll leave. 
You know how to find me if there is anything the papers don't explain. She tapped the other pile of papers as she spoke. I went over and checked. It was just me signing the deed, and then a legal agreement, verifying the house was mine. Three signatures later, Lucille walked out the door and down the steps. The closing door left us alone in the house, and I could feel it around us. It almost felt like Baneurl's realm, but different. I turned to look at Joe and Sable. Ready to explore? Oh, yes. Keep together or split up? Joe asked, looking around, excitement on her face. Let's stay together. I reached over and grabbed the keys. That way I can see if we need any of these and figure out how many locked doors there are. Like three giggling schoolgirls, we started exploring the house. To my relief and Joe's delight, the kitchen had been remodeled and sported very modern, very high-end appliances. Her attention was grabbed by the Viking professional's gas stove, and I couldn't wait to taste what wonders she'd create with that. The first floor was composed of kitchen, dining room, sitting room, a powder room, and a bedroom that had no closets but a beautiful armoire. The back led out to a screened-in porch that connected to the porch that wrapped around from the front of the house. I found it interesting the kitchen had a mini greenhouse at the same end as the porch, though it was empty. Carolyn pretended to be bored, but I was both delighted and disappointed. I guess I had expected monsters to jump out at me, which was silly. This was a house in the middle of Upper New York. At first look, the storage under the stairs seemed smaller than I expected, until we realized the back of the staircase contained a concealed door that we had to press to open. Ooh, secret doors, shall we? Joe was all but bouncing on her toes. This isn't a Scooby-Doo mystery, you know, Sable pointed out, but her smile gave away her excitement level. And it's a house with a secret door and maybe locked rooms. What more can I ask for? I rolled my eyes at them and pulled the chain. A single light bulb on the stairs flickered on, and something downstairs lit up. I started going down the stairs, then paused. Rats and other rodents were not high on my favorite list. Carolyn, on the other hand, thought they were great appetizers. Carolyn, you want to go first and scare any monsters or rodents or monster rodents that might be down there? I suggested. Blood and gore I could handle. Even the live mice I could tolerate. Rats? Ugh. He gave me a supercilious glare and slid past me, but then he went into stock mode as he slipped down the stairs. The three of us waited at the top, Joe snorting at me. She didn't have an issue with rats. There are no rodents or monsters in the basement, Carolyn reported, and he sounded rather dejected by that fact. We headed on down and were greeted with a basement, a slightly damp, bare concrete floor, a rack with some boxes with the word Xmas scrawled across them, and multiple cobwebs. There was a laundry chute and a washer and dryer, basic models, a little laundry sink and folding table. The chute looked like it went up further than the first floor, and I made a note to see where it originated. Nothing else was down there. Ugh. Talk about anticlimactic. This looks like any basement anywhere, at least if they don't have boxes of stuff their kids have grown out of. Joe sounded as dejected as Carolyn. We climbed back up and headed up to the second floor. The house had three full floors, and I knew I needed to walk around the house and look at everything. We headed up the stairs, and I really hoped we'd find something strange or awesome. From the second floor landing, the stairs did a U-turn and continued up to the third floor. The landing had two doors visible, one each to our right and left, and a window looking out to the small orchard in the back. Which door first? I asked, looking at the two doors. This one, Joe said as she took the two steps to the door on her left and reached for the brass knob. It turned easily, revealing another bedroom. The bedroom downstairs had blue wallpaper and a sleigh bed. I dubbed it the blue room in my head while this one was done in mint green and contained a four-poster queen bed. 
We wandered in and found a full bath attached, though not as nice as the one in the blue room. That one had a walk-in shower, while this one just had the standard bath shower combo. Bedroom chick, you know, for a creepy magical house, this is all pretty boring. Joe made a face. Though, at least we have decent bedrooms to select from. Right now, I still want the blue room. I didn't blame her, though I had no doubt she wanted the shower for other reasons than getting clean. Well, other door, I guess. I walked over and grasped the knob, then yanked my hand back with a yelp. Ouch! It zapped me! That grabbed Joe and Sable's attention, and they moved over. Really? Joe looked at me and cautiously touched me. Huh. Not me. Maybe static? She moved to grab the knob and twist. Yuch! She exclaimed as she jerked her hand back. That wasn't static. That was a solid shock. Joe shook her hand, glaring at the doorknob. I couldn't stop the giggle of glee as I peered at the door. Finally, something exciting. Maybe I need to unlock it with the key first, I said, pointing at the lock above it, which, now that I thought about it, was odd. Weren't most keyholes under doors? I looked back at the other door, but it didn't have a keyhole at all. Latch inside the door for privacy. Sable answered my unspoken question, making no move to touch anything. Carolian, on the other hand, lifted his nose to sniff at the knob. You get zapped, it's your own fault, I pointed out as I produced the keys Lucille had provided. Smells like magic. Magic has a scent? Joe asked while I started going through the keys. Everything has a scent. Carolian's condescending voice made me snicker. You have to remember, by your standards, we are nose blind, so it's a valid question. One by one, I tried the keys in the lock. The second to last of the twelve keys turned in the lock. I heard Joe and Sable take in sharp breaths, swallowing. I reached for the door and grasped the handle, ready to jerk my hand away at any moment. This time, nothing happened, and I turned the handle. To my surprise, the door popped open and oddly swung outward, banging into my hand. We stepped back to let it swing all the way open, which it did easily. I stood, blinking at it, then looked back at the bedroom door, double-checking my memory. All the other doors in the house had swung in. Why did this one swing out? We peered in, but the shadows made it hard to get any impression besides cloudy and dusty. I stuck my hand into the room slowly and felt for a light switch. My fingers brushed over a switch and I flipped it up. Bright white, almost blinding light, appeared from hidden lights along the wall. Yow, what is that? An operating room? Joe muttered as she rubbed her eyes. I had to blink several times to get the spots out of my vision. When it had mostly cleared up, the three of us peered in though we didn't step into the room. There were built-in shelves lining all the walls, blocking out any windows that might have been there. The only light came from bulbs on the top of the shelves, bouncing off the reflective ceiling, which was why the light had been so intense. But all that registered as background information. I couldn't take my eyes away from the objects that were crammed into the room. While the shelves had so many things I could have spent days inspecting everything, the three statues in the middle of the room grabbed my attention. Are those people? Sable's voice was low, almost hushed as if in a church. Statues of people? I think so. But I shared her reaction. Even from here, it looked like people in mid-motion, frozen in an instant in time. From what I could see, all three of them were positioned as if they were facing the door. They were statues of one man and two women. Their clothing, hair, expressions, all screamed true. To me, they looked like three-dimensional images of real people. So why are they locked in this room? What is the rest of the stuff? Jo had stuck her head in and turned it one way and another, trying to see more. I'm going in. Stand here and make sure the door doesn't close. I glanced at the door. 
having nightmare visions of the door slamming closed and getting trapped in that room and the statues coming alive. You got it. Joe didn't laugh or even act like my fear was stupid. She sat on the ground, about a foot from the threshold, and Sable stood against the jam forcing the door to remain open. For it to close now, it would have to push both Sable and Joe out of the way, and that would take effort and time. Enough time they could yell a warning. Chapter 6 There is an issue with allowing Merlins out after a decade. Most Merlins, at least the ones that survived the draft, research magic and discover things that should be shared with the scientists of the OMO, not kept to themselves. If we required Merlins to serve 30 or 40 years and required all research to be turned over, our understanding of magic would triple in a decade. OMO Internal Memo I straightened my shoulders and stepped across the threshold, feeling the warm brush of Caroline's fur against my leg as he walked in with me. The statues took up most of the floor space in the room, but there was also a sundial, a bird bath, and what looked like an obelisk that brushed the ceiling. It looked disturbingly like the one I'd melted, but it seemed taller and maybe a bit more slender. Maybe. How did they get that thing in here? Carolyn sniffed the statues as I turned to look at the shelves, even though turning my back on those all-too-real pieces of art made my skin crawl. The shelves wrapped around the room, with only the door as a break, and they were filled with so many objects I couldn't begin to identify what I saw. Small sculptures sat on the shelves, though not with the detail of the statues, intermixed with objects that resembled bones, shiny rocks, and even feathers that looked like they had been plucked from Georgas' tail. Georgas. Even thinking his name brought a crystal-clear image of the phoenix familiar of James Wells, the person who had willed the house to me, to the forefront of my mind. James was also a spirit Merlin. Georgas had ashed right before James died, so the familiar hadn't been able to search for me until recently. While Georgas wasn't a friend like how I regarded Banyarl, he was an advisor, more like Esmir, Carolyn's mother. Though I wanted to reach out and touch things, wariness born of my experience with the murder ball during my initial testing prevented that. Touching that innocuous-looking billard ball had pulled me into the emotions and feelings of both the murderer and his victims. I never wanted to repeat that again. So? Joe's impatient voice called out to me. What's in there? I grinned, but didn't take my eyes off the objects around me. Everything? Anything? I see feathers, stones, eggs, and other crap. Heck, if I didn't know better, I'd think some of the eggs were still viable. There are sculptures, a few hand-bound books, and sealed jars, though those I can't tell what may or may not be in them. No money or gold or gems? Joe sounded wistful, and I rolled my eyes. It's not a dragon's hoard, if that is what you were expecting. It's more of a collection of objects. I don't want to say they are all art, but they all have an odd presence. This is a memory stone. Carolyn had risen up on his hind legs and tapped a large opal. It had a crack of gold running down it, probably ruining it as a gemstone but the milky stone held hints of fire and lightning as the light shifted over it. Oh? We'd all played with memory stones. Esmir had given me one, and I'd been using it a little at a time. It contained a lifetime of memories, and while I could go through them much faster than they had been created, they were from the point of view of a cath. And how a cath used magic and how my mind interpreted it were vastly different but using the stone had refined my ability to sidestep and use magic. Caths had perfected using kinetic energy as offerings, instead of just cellular material, and it helped them hunt, step through doors between planes, and create homes to keep them safe and warm. Yes, I don't know what species. You can pick it up and find out. There was a bit of a challenge in his tone, 
and I wasn't falling for it. He was still a cat and chaos called to him. I think not. Maybe later. I took one more look around, then stepped back out. Maybe I'd come back with a silk scarf so I could pick things up without activating the magic. That had been a Christmas present from Marisol, Joe's mother, who treated me more like a daughter than anything else. You're no fun, Sable muttered, looking like she wanted to go in there and explore. Adrenaline junkie? I retorted, and she bobbed her head in agreement. Yep, so maybe tomorrow? See what they are? The idea of playing with magical artifacts worried and excited me, but I wanted to finish exploring the house. Maybe. Right now, we have more of the house to look at. Joe rose from her seat on the floor, and we all moved away from the door. I half expected it to slam shut, but it acted like a door. I closed it and removed the key, making sure I hadn't locked it again. I didn't want anyone to get zapped again. Curious, I reached out, grabbed the knob, and twisted. It opened easily. Huh. Joe, you want to try? I stepped back, and she mimicked my actions, and the door opened. So, short-term magic. Once you unlock it, it's unlocked? Joe guessed. All of us stared at the simple knob and keyhole. Both? Either? Neither? Heck if I know. I don't think this house comes with an instruction manual. I bit my lip, but the lure of exploring the rest of the house was too strong. I turned and headed further down the hall. The landing area had subtle wallpaper of dark beige. Someday, when I had money, I'd think about redoing it. Wallpaper wasn't my favorite thing, but it did fit the house. The stretch of hallway between the stairs and the memento room ended in an opening between two rooms. I stepped into that area. There was a door set into the wall facing the front yard. Wary of the knobs now, I touched it, ready for another shock. Nothing happened so I turned it and pulled the door open. To my delight, it revealed a small deck big enough for a nice lounge chair and a small table. It currently contained two rather worn folding chairs. I could already see me spending fall and spring days out there reading or studying. There was a door on the right of the deck, leading to another room, but I stepped back into the house and headed to the room on the left of the deck. This door was ajar, and when I touched it, it swung inwards to reveal the master bedroom. Wow, can we say guy vibes everywhere? Joe asked, peering over my shoulder. I had to agree. The room color scheme was dark green with dark wood. There was little soft about it. Even the two pillows on the bed were flat and uninviting. But the room itself, ignoring the dark color scheme, was good size. The bed was a simple sleigh style, not pretty, but not offensive either. The room was more barren than I expected, with a single framed painting across from the bed, and nothing else besides a low stool in the room. Moving in further, there was a door towards what I assumed was the bathroom, but the colors in the painting caught me. Georgas, I said, looking at the picture. Carolyn brushed the back of my legs, and I heard him land on the bed behind me. Humph. Can we bring the hammock in here? This bed is harder than the ground. I turned to see him tapping the bed with his front paw, and there wasn't any give under his weight. I moved over and pushed, hard as a rock. Okay, I agree. New mattress needed. I took a breath and remembered I had a checking account to go with the house. Not that I looked at it. I would need to do that later. For now, I'd make do or try one of the other rooms. Pillows and blankets were always an option. Marlin's beard, come take a look at this bathroom, Gory. I turned to see Joe disappearing through the other door. I followed her, stopping inside the doorway. I understood her surprise. As bland and spartan as the bedroom had been, the bathroom was the opposite. As you walked in, there was a sink in what looked to be a marble counter, and opposite was a walk-in shower of the same marble. Nestled next to the shower was a toilet with what looked like a bidet attachment. I only recognized the bidet from Sable's pics of her trip to Japan with her dad over Christmas. A few more steps brought you to a clawfoot tub, and across from it was a walk-in closet. 
The tub was set up with ledges, perfect for bath salts and a glass of wine, and it had not only the standard faucet, but a spray attachment. Oh, think how nice that will be in the winter. I wonder how big the hot water heater is. I stared at the tub with longing. Our college apartment had the standard tiny tubs that were always uncomfortable, no matter what size you were. Tankless, saw it on the wall downstairs, so the answer is unlimited, Joe said, looking around. Huh, this even has enough closet space for mine and Sable's clothes. Nope, mine. You get your own house if I survive. I grinned at her, and she gave me a mock sigh. Cruel you are. Oh, well. We left and walked across the hall, and I fell in love once again. Men and women didn't seem to generate much passion in me, but the study I walked into did. There were two sets of windows, one facing the front, the other the right side of the house, and a door leading out to the deck. The remaining walls were floor-to-ceiling bookcases, and the ceilings were at least ten feet high. They were half-filled with books I couldn't wait to look at, to see what they were about. There was a ladder on a rail that went all the way around the room, a window bench with, oddly enough, comic book long boxes under it, graced the window to the side. The window facing the front had a desk built seamlessly into the flow of the bookshelves. It looked about five feet long and two feet deep with drawers with keyholes on each side. In the middle of the room, a chair in rich burgundy leather presided over everything, a small rectangular table that swung over the arms of the chair next to it. Throughout the study, there was the motif of a tree, subtle, with a leaf here, a burl of wood there, but it made it feel rich and welcoming. I'll sleep in here if I have to. The chair even had a matching leather ottoman. I do believe that's the first time I've ever seen her drooling lust over anything, Sable said, a thoughtful tone to her voice. You may be right. Closest I've ever seen her come was stroking a $900 leather coat that fit her like a glove. Joe sounded like she was trying not to laugh. I spun to glare at them and wiped my lips to make sure I wasn't drooling. They both started laughing. I didn't know whether to pout or ignore them. So I took the high road and turned to admiring the room again. Caroline had jumped up and sat on the window seat, looking out at the view. Acceptable. We all laughed, and I planned on spending a lot of time here later. But for now, I wanted to explore the rest of the house. I turned and headed back to go up the stairs. Sable and Joe talked behind me, but I didn't try to figure out what they said. I wanted to see the last floor of the house. A door waited at the top of the stairs, and I reached out to open it. There wasn't a shock this time, but the knob didn't turn. Shrugging, I pulled out the keys and went to try the first one when I paused. There wasn't a keyhole. Joe, how do you lock a door with no key? What? Are we asking riddles now? She squeezed up next to me and looked at the door. That's odd. She crouched down to inspect the knob. No hole in it. I was thinking maybe it was like a bathroom door lock. She grabbed the knob and tried to turn it harder. She had much more strength than I did, but it didn't budge. I glared at the door. It was like having a prize just out of my reach. Maybe there's a latch? Just remember, none of us are Nancy Drew. Why don't you see if your magic can figure it out? Joe said, stepping back out of my way. Magic isn't the answer for everything. I muttered as I checked to make sure there wasn't a latch or a switch to release the door. There wasn't. I sighed and filtered through the ideas while I had access to a huge range of abilities. Knocking down the door wasn't an option, or burning it, or causing it to disintegrate. As it was a door in a house, I couldn't really read its mind. But maybe I could read past images? My psychometry, the ability to read emotions and feelings from objects, was off the charts, and most of the time I had it locked so far down I forgot about it. Getting random hits of memories and emotions off of things was rarely pleasant, not to mention the offering for it was so tiny that usually I didn't consciously offer. It was just given. I reached out and grasped the knob, then unleashed that part of me. At first, there was nothing, then a questioning feeling, then laughter. 
In my mind, a word clearly emerged. No. It vibrated in my mind, but there wasn't anger, more like amusement for a child from an elder. I ripped my hand back with an eep. What? Get zapped again? Joe was at my side, checking my hand over. No, not that. The house, or I think it was the house, said no. Very firmly. Sable and Joe stared at me. The house? Sable asked slowly. Well, it sounded like the house. I mean, not sure who else it could be. I turned to look at the door. I guess that stays locked for now. Only you, Corey. You get a cool house with opinions. Houses aren't supposed to have opinions. Joe gave me an exasperated but loving look. Just for that, I hope your house has a personality and stubbornness to match yours. I retorted, feeling a teeny bit insulted on behalf of my house. Sable choked and started to laugh as Joe gaped at me. Corey, that's mean. She finally protested, even as she tried to fight her own giggles. You deserved it. I turned and headed back down. I need to go over the documents Lucille left, and we should go grocery shopping. I'm starving. Yes, food. I think fresh fish would be appropriate. Steamed, not fried. And are you going to cook it? Joe asked archly, staring at the cat waiting for us to go back down. Of course not. Cooking is a human thing. I am simply catering to your customs. He sniffed and started down the stairs, his tail whipping back and forth like a conductor's baton. That cat. Joe's voice was full of exasperated love. Yes, I suspect we made him that way, but I wouldn't say no to fresh steamed fish, Sable said. And we need to unpack the car and probably change the beds. Who knows the last time the sheets were washed. We headed down the stairs to the landing, and I gave one last look at the mysterious third level. Oh well, it would wait. As we reached the first floor, Joe cleared her throat. I turned to look at her. You getting sick? No getting sick. We have a summer off. I'd finally bought into the idea and wanted to read and have fun exploring, and maybe spend time in that study looking at the books and other items in the memento room. I suspected most of them were magical. No, I, well, we, she started and I frowned at her. Sable cut in. We were thinking fish for dinner and go explore the surrounding areas. You mind if we head out? Off balance at the odd start, I shook my head. No, go, enjoy. I want to investigate the study more. Joe gave Sable a funny look, then grinned. Okay, see ya. In a rush of long hair, they were gone, and the whole situation just left a bad feeling at the base of my spine. Chapter 7 Relationships between high-level mages are either practically perfect or time bombs waiting to go off. Matching mages by ranks rarely works without something else to connect them. Magic explained. Joe's weird behavior still niggled at the back of my mind, but having the place to myself felt nice. So much had happened today, I wanted time to sit and process all the revelations. I sat in the study, going over the paperwork, and trying to decide what I wanted to do with the house. While it was mine, I still had a few years of schooling left, plus the draft, and there was no telling where I'd end up. Well, probably not Japan. The emperor had not been happy with the ultimatums he'd been given after trying to get me killed, The idea of letting the house sit empty for so long felt wrong, but so did the idea of renting it out or having strangers live here. Why do I feel so oddly proprietary over a house I just set foot in? I mulled over that question as I looked at the papers. The paperwork in the file included plat maps and property lines for the entire street, as well as the tax assessment records. She had also included the requests for access to various items, some I knew I'd seen in the trophy room. I shoved those in a folder. Until I had to deal with them, I would ignore them. The last pile contained the utility and tax payment records since James Wells died. The amount for the taxes made me nauseous. 
If nothing else, Lucille Blanding was very well organized. She left a manila envelope, and I slid most of the paperwork back inside, leaving out the checkbook, the notes about the house, and a list of service people who had worked in the house over the last year. The view out the front of the office made me smile as I looked out at the quiet street. I could so imagine Joe and Sable's kids playing outside, and part of me craved to create a little enclave of friends and loved ones, though at this point I didn't know who else I wanted. You think Esmir would be willing to come visit if we moved here? What about Banyarl or Georgas? I looked over at Carolyn, who had positioned himself so the afternoon light bathed him in a gold glow, the ruby red of his fur sparkling as he made sure every hair looked perfect. Esmir would enjoy, though she might expect to stay more. As for the others, he flicked an ear dismissively. Hmm. Don't you have siblings? The thought struck me. Surely he wasn't an only kiddar. Litter mates? Two. Though Malkin has had three litters. He fell silent for a moment, then focused on grooming his tail. First litter died. Second only had one live. Third litter was best. All three of us are strong and healthy, though I am only focus. I had to think that through. The beings or creatures of the other realms referred to familiars as focuses, and they regarded it as almost a calling, from what I could figure out. But I didn't understand how life worked in the realms. It definitely didn't resemble our world with cities and jobs. And while I knew the beings there were intelligent, they functioned so differently from humans, I barely tried to compare the two. I'm sorry... I didn't know how to react to that news. Carolyn didn't even flick an ear in my direction as he sprawled out, covering the length of the window seat, his front paws dangling off the side of the leather cushion. Is life. It always goes on. Wasn't that the truth? I shook my head and finally thought about the interaction with the bean when I took the keys to the house. While I still didn't know what it was testing me for, I was pretty sure it was the source of the voice that told me, no, when I tried to open the door to the third floor. Though why that should be off limits, I didn't know. The treasure room, or at least that was what I dubbed it in my mind, made sense. If those were learning devices from the other realms, the value they represented was incredible. And I still wasn't sure about the three statues and the metallic obelisk. Heck, the fact that fire had melted it for me and somehow gained nourishment from metal, if that is what it was, also freaked me out a bit. How can a house be magical? I said the words out loud, but everything I could think of didn't make sense. Enchantment was rare and difficult. Only Merlins had the power to do it, and most never bothered to learn. It was restricted to Merlins because you needed multiple classes to combine the branches, to create magical objects. Granted, those Merlins made plenty of money for every enchanted item they created. But still, they were rare and difficult to make. That paused my thoughts. Were they really? I learned the hard way that common knowledge was often wrong, usually to my detriment. One of the things I'd learned over the last 18 months was how to reach someone I knew in a different realm, which meant, in theory... I could contact Esmir, Georgaz, Banyarl, or Tursane. In reality, I'd only contact Tursane if the world was ending, and even then I might think about it a while. I shrugged and opened up a micro-rip, something most mages didn't think was possible, and sent out a ping to Banyarl. If he was interested, he'd respond. It had taken me a while to learn the etiquette. Pings were the equivalent of a ring. One ring. It said who was calling. And if the person you pinged wanted to respond, they would. If they didn't, they might ping you later, or they might not. For most beings in the other realms, time was relative, and not responding meant nothing other than they weren't interested at the moment. And then if they remembered you had pinged, they might call you. The remembering was important. Overall, they seemed to live in the now, not the future and past like we did. Corey, how is your road trip going? Bainyarl asked in my mind. My teacher, 
A griffin with white feathers that darkened to deep blue on his wings was a merlin in his own right, though with him it meant he had access to all the spirit branches at full power, not just three in various levels of strength. He'd become a friend to the three of us over the last year, plus. Carolian had arranged the teacher relationship. Time had created the friendship. It didn't surprise me at all that he knew about our road trip, though I doubt he truly understood it. Interesting. I still had to think my words carefully to speak telepathically. Most of the time, it was easier to speak out loud. But since we were talking across realms, that wouldn't work. I have a question. This house is weird. Can a house be enchanted? House? He paused, thinking. I am unsure. I know of one where the mage in question added chicken legs to it, and it would walk around. But it was small, no larger than your living room. I couldn't imagine an entire house being affected that way. I blinked at the idea of chicken legs attached to a house, though my main thought was, why? But I shook my head, trying not to get sidetracked. May I send you a memory? Of course. I focused on the experience with the gray space and sent it to him like a small video clip, something else I had learned to do, though it felt odd. That happened, and the house seems to talk to me and has rooms it won't allow open. I didn't think you could do that. As I waited for his response, it felt like an eternity, I flipped open the register on the checkbook and choked. Glory? Carolyn asked as I heard him rustling around on the window bench. I'm fine, sorry. I couldn't take my eyes off the balance of the register, trying to comprehend what I saw. Bainerol did the equivalent of clearing his throat. It created an odd vibration in my mind. I see. Corey, proceed carefully. Your house is not enchanted, but I fear I cannot tell you more without forsaking my own allegiance. Wait, what? That pulled me out of my dumbfounded reaction to the checkbook, and I had to repeat it telepathically for him to hear. Corey, magic is following your actions, and I would not dare to cross her plans. I narrowed my eyes, wishing he was here for me to glare at. You telling me that was magic challenging me? Testing me? Another pause, but this time I remained focused. No, I don't believe so. But whatever is going on, she is involved. He paused again, and I started to say something, but he continued. Corey, you're strong, smart, and more creative than you think. You see magic differently than any of my students, even more differently than Joe or Sable see it. Have faith in yourself. If magic is reaching out to you, then you are honored beyond all but a few. If you truly have questions about what magic might be looking for, you could ask Tursane. Um, no. Thank you, Bainerl. I hope someday to have you over for a visit. I changed the subject. Tursane was not someone I thought of as a safe acquaintance. I would enjoy that. Farewell, Corsand. His voice faded from my mind, and I shut the micro portal. My queen is powerful. You will succeed. I rolled my eyes at Kirlian. And if I don't? And succeed at what? I don't have the slightest idea of what I'm being asked to do. And I'm so tired of people pulling at me. When do I get to make my own path? Taking a deep breath to calm myself, I went back to the checkbook this time to make sure what I saw had been fact. The register had in neat handwriting a list of the ongoing balance, and the front listed the website for the bank. The balance was what had me really stunned. 234867 and 37 cents. That amount of money seemed unreal. I pulled up the documents Lucille had left for me, and her crisp, clear, and becoming familiar writing She explained, This account pulls in the rent from the other houses and pays out the taxes and house insurance for all properties on this street. You are free to use the money to update the house as much as it allows. 
though lowering the balance much below 75000 would be unwise, as that is needed for taxes and insurance payments. Here is the account name and PIN for that account. You can see the deposits monthly from the renters. Call if you have any questions. I started going through the register and looking at the notes. Then I pulled up the account and saw she'd meticulously copied over the info from there to the checkbook. A lump formed in my throat. The pressure of more money than I'd ever had and stress at what to do with it battled each other. A hard object slipped out of the register and clattered against the desk. I picked up the debit card and looked at it, the pin reference in the letter now making sense. I looked at the dollar amount again and smiled. While going hog wild with money would be the height of stupidity, we were going to be here for the next 12 weeks. I could justify buying a comfortable mattress and some new sheets. With glee, I signed into Amazing, the massive online shopping site. 20 minutes later, I had a new mattress. Three sets of sheets, I had to run down and make sure what size the mattresses were in the two guest bedrooms, and a huge dog bed for Carolyn. He insisted if I was getting a new bed, he deserved one too. I had just finished with my orders, complete with the panic of putting in the debit card and expecting it to be declined, when I saw Joe and Sable pull up in the driveway. I verified everything and closed my laptop before heading down the stairs. They were approaching the door with grocery bags. I pulled open the front door, both oddly buoyant and tense. The house had a tingle to it that kept pulling at me, and I didn't know if I hated or loved it. Either way, it kept me on edge. Hey, looks like you found food, I said as I followed them into the kitchen. While I learned to cook after figuring out how to dispel the Murphy's cloak that had been attached to me for almost a decade, I wasn't good. I can make eggs and sandwiches and pancakes, but that was about it. Joe, on the other hand, had learned at her mother's knee, and Marisol could make food sit up and dance. Part of it was Marisol was a fire mage, wizard to be exact, but most of it was she'd learned to cook the same way, at her mother's knee. Sable wasn't bad in the kitchen, but she needed a recipe to make most things. All of this meant Sable and I did most of the dishes, and Joe did most of the cooking and shopping. Occasionally, I felt guilty, but usually eating her food assuaged that guilt. We did! This place is nice. There's an awesome butcher's market just about five miles away, and a nice supermarket not too much further. Needless to say, we won't starve while we're here, Joe said. But she didn't look at me, and I stared at her as she put the groceries on the counter and started separating out the stuff that needed to go into the fridge versus the pantry. Joe? I prodded. Evasive and unwilling to look at me was off for Joe. Then her weirdness before they left worried me. Did something happen? Terror squeezed at my heart a bit. Joe still had the scar from the bullet meant for me that had gone through her a scar she'd tattooed a ruby red cat over. Happened? No, just... She paused, chewing on her lip. Sable broke in. She's overreacting. Sable smiled at me and leaned into Joe. We were discussing getting married after she gets her master's. So, next year. Thoughts? Chapter 8 Magic artifacts are relatively rare. Those who have them keep them quiet, though there are rumors of an active underground trade of these objects. However, most people can't use them, so there hasn't been much interest in their acquisition. Magic Explained Online The world closed in around me, and I felt my chest constrict so tight that I was sure it would compact into a tight ball. Air froze in my lungs, and the image of Joe walking away, hand in hand with Sable, never looking back at me, made my eyes water as I fought not to scream. Time stopped as I tried to bring my emotions under control and willed myself not to do something I'd regret. Four needle points of pain sank into my calf, shattering the nascent spell and my emotional fugue. I gasped, jerking my leg away. That hurt! What are you doing? I glared at Carolyn, who had sunk his teeth into my calf. I expected to see blood streaming down my leg, 
but there was only four drops of blood. Silly queen, listen and don't see monsters where there are none. His words, just for me. Carolyn flicked his tail at me and rose up on his hind legs to inspect the bags. Is there salmon for me? That was broadcast to everyone as I rubbed my leg. Carolyn, why did you bite Cory? There is salmon, but you bit her. I'm sending you to bed without food. Joe snapped, staring at him like he'd sprouted wings. Shit, I was just about to spiral into a massive panic attack. He stopped that. It's okay, he had a reason. I narrowed my eyes at the cat who ignored me. I licked my dry lips and forced a smile at Joe and Sable. Marriage? Joe looked at me, worry in her eyes. Then she glanced at Sable. We wondered if you'd be okay with that. I blinked at them, the words not making sense. I don't understand. Oh, we are making a tangle of this. Joe, give me the Chenin Blanc and find three glasses. As Sable spoke, she shoved a bag of chocolate-covered pretzels at me. Corey, go to the back porch and sit. We'll be there in a moment. Carolyn, you touch that fish and I'll put habanero powder over everything you ate. Carolyn dropped down and sauntered out to the back porch as if he didn't care about the threat. I shook my head and followed him out, sinking into one of the chairs there, staring blankly at the trees behind the house. The bright green of the chlorophyll from the apple trees countered the bleakness in my heart. I'd always known I'd lose Joe, but I'd been allowing myself to hope. I couldn't protect people if they slipped away from me. I glanced at my phone, taking in the date. Six years and 23 days before Christos would be given the information to contact me. My younger brother, whom my parents had fled with to make sure he couldn't get to know me. Would I lose him too? Before I ever had a chance to be part of his life? The door banged open, and I jerked up and looked at Sable as she walked out, Joe following behind her. Sit, woman. The look she gave Joe had my indomitable best friend slinking into a chair, and I started to bristle, hating to see her crushed. Shush, Corey, and listen. Sable handed out the glasses of wine. I took it reflexively, looking at the two of them. Joe sipped her glass, looking miserable, and I couldn't figure out what I was missing. Corey, you have abandonment issues. They are valid. Merlin knows your parents were damaged by Stevie's death. I couldn't stop the flinch that occurred at the mention of Stevie. My brother had died in my arms when I was 12. I had emerged as a reaction to his death. Even today, it hurt, and my parents were broken by his death. Maybe I was too. Someday I'd figure out what killed him and make sure no one else died that way. I took a sip of wine, letting the sharp Chenin Blanc clear my mouth and mind. Not my favorite, though not bad. Sable didn't really like the sweeter stuff. I know you and Joe are a couple, and always will be. I jerked my head up and stared at her, a protest on my lips, but Joe had drawn her head in and hunched her shoulders like she expected a beating. Sable just smiled. You forget? I've traveled a lot with my dad. I know you two are a couple. I also know while there is enough love to restart the sun, there's no lust. And that is okay. Sable didn't shout the words, but their truth settled in my bones, and I started to relax while Joe just looked more scared. So what does you two getting married mean? I asked not as scared of the answer as I had been a few minutes ago. That is what we want to talk to you about. Now remember, Joe still has close to two years before her master's is done, and I start my draft in late August. With Sable entering the draft, we had no guarantee she would stay in Atlanta for the entire time. Terror jabbed at me as I saw my comfortable little life start to crumble, and I bit down on my panic. I'd been through worse. I would make it. I like having her around. The plaintive cry in my own head forced me to take a sip of the wine to cover my reaction. I am head over heels in love with Joe, and I love you too, Corey. I jerked my head up at this, and I saw Joe relax a bit. I like living with you. You're a great foil. Now, if someday we do have kids, one way or the other, all of us in one house might be a bit much. 
But if the dreams of this come true, then it changes things. She waved her hands around to encompass the street and other homes. But what we need to know is, what do you want? I forced a smile. Besides being the best person at your wedding? They both grinned. I don't know. And I didn't. I sat back and thought about it. Can I wait to give you an answer? Sable started laughing. <laughs> yes, you have a few years. While we can get married during our draft service, there's no guarantee Joe will be placed near either of us. And if you have a decade before, all of this is yours. True, but this place is mine. It is big enough. It might have been a plea. Carolyn huffed and laid his head on my knees. Sable smiled and nudged Joe. You two are an old married couple. Corey, all we are saying, the part Joe seems to be terrified to say, is any marriage involving her will include you. You are as much a part of her as a child would be. So I'm asking, what do you want? I shrugged, helpless to answer that question. I'll think about it. That's all I want. Now, neither of us has proposed or even are considering this until after our dress. But we know, or I know, though I'm not sure the two of you are fully aware, that you're happier when you're near each other. So, we need this to work, she said, her voice breaking a bit at the end, and I saw through the facade she presented, seeing her fear and worry also. Joe, what are you worried about? Sable had her calm, supportive face on, and I didn't know what to make of it. Joe hid her face behind the wine glass, not really drinking, but twirling it in her hands. Joe? Sable prompted, and I stared at Joe, worried. I'm scared that I'll lose Corey if I marry you. That us as a family won't work. Then I'm scared I'll lose you when you find out. She stopped and took a big gulp of wine and shrunk even further into herself. Find out? Find out what? Okay, I'm not sure what that means, but I can tell you what I'm worried about, Sable said. I shifted my attention to her, now feeling like a racquetball as I bounced between Sable, the wall, and Joe, never knowing which to pay attention to. I'm terrified I'll screw it up between you two. Or worse, that I won't be enough to be part of you, yet not part of you. Your relationship is special, and I don't want to damage it. I don't know if I can live knowing you will always be first to Joe, but I don't want you to be second. This time she looked down, and I stared at them. What do I say? I want you two to be happy. You're good for each other. I blurted the words, coming out frantic and raw to my horror. You can't break up. Joe would never forgive me. Terror at the idea of me coming between Joe and Sable warred with the fear of losing her. Losing them. Neither was more powerful than the other. By the realms, are all humans as emotional as you three? Or is it just queens that do this? Carolyn's words sliced through the angst, and I looked down at him where he sat, licking his balls in the middle of all of us. That was intended to be rude. He'd admitted to understanding the nuances of human behavior. He just thought it was ridiculous. What are you talking about? I glared at him as he paid great attention to the fur in his nether regions. Relationships. Why all the drama? They are parts of life, not magic-shattering moments. Triad, coven, pride. He paused and lifted his head. No pride. There is no male, and Alexin is not suitable. But choose. Flex, adapt. You get lost in your patterns that aren't needed. I stared at him. We aren't sexually interested in each other, or at least I'm not in them. Humans, this makes no sense. I must talk to my Malkin. He stood, and with a pinprick of pain from the rip forming, he stepped from our world to another and was gone. I blinked, surprised and unsure what to make of that. He knew how I felt, right? I love that cat, but I'm so glad he isn't my familiar. Joe muttered. I looked up to see her shaking her head. I'm going to cook. I need to think. 
She stood up, taking her wine glass, and strode into the kitchen, leaving Sable and me sitting there with the dragon-sized knot of emotions, fears, and worry sitting behind us. Maybe... (laughs) I coughed, clearing out the tears that clung to the back of my throat. Maybe we need to think about this for a few days. It doesn't have to be decided today, does it? I just needed to hear the words again, that I had time. Sable stared at her feet, not looking at me. No, Joe needs to graduate and probably serve. And who knows where I'll end up before my draft is over. While I'm starting in Atlanta, there's no assurance I'll stay there. Distance might kill us before anything else does. Grabbing her glass, she headed out to the back, leaving me wondering which us she had meant. Dinner that night was quiet. We all ate at the dining room table. It's rich wood, delicate china plates, and soothing blue-green brocade walls, a spiteful contrast to our withdrawn moods. Even the delicious food Joe had cooked didn't get us to talk, and I fled to my room, more than willing to sleep on rocks than stay down there, and feel like what had been golden and precious had tarnished beyond all notice. Did this come out of nowhere? The last six months had been crazy insane, as I took 26 units to get my blasted degree. I'd barely spoken or done anything besides work and study. The most time I spent with them was on Mondays and Wednesdays when we had classes with Banyarl. I teased apart my memories and thought back. Joe had been tense, and Sable kept watching me, a look of worry on her face. And I'd caught Joe watching Sable with a look of longing and fear, but I'd brush them off as they smiled as soon as they caught me looking. But their time alone had become more rare, and their lovemaking more desperate. That I only knew because of Carolyn snarking about them making more noise than yetis in rutting season and twice as deprived. My heart twisted and squirmed as I reviewed the past year, and I saw how stupidly blind I'd been. I was so wrapped up in my own stuff, I'd shut them out more than I had intended. I still thought their relationship was strong, but with the three of us, there were dynamics I'd missed, or been avoiding. That rocked me back. Did I want them to fail? The automatic negation of the thought reassured me, but it left me trying to figure out what I wanted and how to make sure I didn't destroy something precious for Joe. Why is it the people I love are the ones that get hurt? I finally found a conformable position on the rock-hard bed by using all the blankets in the closet to make a pad. The new mattress couldn't get here fast enough. I fell asleep with the images of Stevie dying in my arms, the pained looks on my parents' faces, and the devastation of the Guzman's garage. Chapter 9 Mages are being set up as a protected class. Stop it now by voting for our Freedom from Magic candidates. They are the only way to make sure the playing field is level for everyone. College shouldn't be free to only a portion of the population. Freedom from Magic Ad Gray nothingness surrounded me, and I spun around looking for the figure or the voice. Where are you? Why am I here? My voice cracked and I called mentally for Carolian. Carolian, they took me. Help! I didn't know if he would hear me because I didn't know where I was. Why should a focus help you? You don't help others. The voice whispered through the space, but there was no other sounds to mask it. It came from everywhere and nowhere, and I stopped my spinning, forcing myself to breathe and think. The words made me mad. I'd spent my life trying to be someone who helped others. That was why I worked so hard to get my paramedic license. Then finding out I was a mage, a Merlin, destroyed all of that. While it made me some money, I'd never be allowed to do that as part of the draft. Another deep breath, forcing myself to think. This was an unknown, powerful creature. Reacting in anger might get me killed. It took work but I managed to control my desire to lash out, more off-balance than I had been when I'd been hijacked the first time. Yes, I do. 
I'm a first responder. I'm trying to get a degree that will help me research how to help people, to find out how to stop people from dying. People like my brother. You used your limited skills to apply bandages to wounds. You do not use the power that lies within you. All you care about are your own wants and desires. That stung even more, but a trickle of guilt washed at me. Was this voice right? Should I be doing more with my magic? I'd always shied away from that question, focusing on anything else but that. Now, in this gray space where I felt disconnected from everything, even my own body, I looked at the question, am I being selfish? The question hung so powerfully in my mind, I didn't know if I'd spoken it or not. All beings are selfish, but when one is as blessed as you are, you have a responsibility to others. My temper and guilt faded. I whirled again, looking for the voice, for something to focus on. What do you call the draft? What about people being responsible to me? I fought for everything I have. I shouted into the gray. So? So? So why should I do things for other people? What have they done for me? Who cares about humans? For the first time, I heard a touch of emotion in the voice. Shock, or maybe surprise. What have you done to help or honor magic? I froze, blinking as if trying to make the grayness fade or change. Magic? It was the same way Banyarl and Esmir referred to it, almost as a being. Why would magic care? Have you no answer, Harold? That comment brought the memory back to me. Georgas, Esmir, and Banyarl talking to me after the showdown in Japan. They had mentioned I was Magic's Herald, but what did that mean to this creature? You see, you're trespassed now, gifted as you are, and you have not come to Magic to offer your gratitude. Mortals, they are all the same. All they think is how power can benefit them. Reach out and take what will eliminate your folly. As the voice finished, an object appeared floating about chest high. It shone so bright in that gray area that I couldn't make out any details, only that it appeared to be the size of an orange. It called to me, and even though I knew whatever had me here didn't mean me good, I drew closer to see what it was. The glow that it emitted was just too seductive, and I reached my hand out to pull it closer so I could inspect it. Pain shot up my arm, and I felt it drag down away from the object. A scream tore out of my throat as I fell to the ground, clutching at my arm. A red, furry head met my outstretched hand, his teeth buried in my arm, blood running from the punctures of his canines. Killian! I gasped, torn between pain and shock. I blinked, trying to figure out where I was. The hall wall was behind me, and a door was in front of me. I figured I was near the memento room. His mouth still wrapped around my arm. He glared up at me. Are you back? Pounding steps came up the stairs as Joe and Sable rushed up. What by Merlin's balls is going on? Kellyan? Joe sounded worried and scared. The two of you did not wake up when I went to your bedroom. I called. Your door was locked, and I couldn't open it to get to you. He snarled the words in my mind as he opened his jaw by increments, trying to pull his teeth out without creating any more damage. So you bit her? Joe exclaimed. Sable had rushed back downstairs while Joe dropped down beside me, inspecting the wound. She was walking in her sleep. Not responding. I didn't have any other way to get through to her. Minor scratches didn't register, and my teeth don't do as much damage as my claws. His mouth released my arm, and he sat back, licking his mouth with an odd quirk to his muzzle. Humans taste off. Lech. This coming from a cat that eats things that are still moving, I said, trying to ignore the fact that my voice shook. I inspected the wound and saw he'd done a good job of not leaving a lot of damage. 
His words about claws made me glance down at my bare legs, and I saw runs of blood from scratches. Just seeing them made them start to sting and hurt like crazy. Crap, Gillian, and you weren't trying to kill her? Joe stared at my leg, a stressed look on her face, but the tone of her voice had shed the anger. I did not believe that walking into a room full of magical objects well under control of someone or something else was a good idea. He licked at his paws, wrinkling his nose as he did so. Here, Sable said, shoving first aid supplies at me. I'd been so focused on my pain and the blood dripping everywhere, I hadn't heard her coming back up. Ah, thanks. I spent the next few minutes getting my wounds cleaned and making sure they were all minor. You did a good job of missing all the major veins in my arm. You managed to not nick any tendons either. I commented as I cleaned up the last of them. Carolyn might be a familiar, but I knew what he ate, and I had no desire to have my wounds get infected. He sniffed in my mind. I paid attention during our anatomy class. It pays to know all that. Makes killing easier if you know where best to strike. That had me snorting in laughter and pulling a bit tighter on the bandage than I had intended. That caused me to meep in pain while Sable and Joe lunged to help. Ten minutes later, everything bandaged, all the supplies put away. Sable dragged us down to the sitting room. It was 2.30 in the morning, and I couldn't avoid talking about it anymore. Nope, Sable said before I could start. We're all wide awake. I'm making us tea with honey, chamomile tea, and I'm adding a shot of whiskey and getting us some cookies. Then you can talk. She shot a hard look at Carolyn. Both of you. Carolyn, who had curled up on the ottoman, just flicked his ear at her, but didn't say anything. I wrapped myself in a blanket. Even if it wasn't remotely cold in the house, I wanted something to convince me I was safe. I tried to peel apart the dream, or experience, or whatever it was, but before I could get too far in, Sable came back with tea, cookies, and a bowl of something red and chunky for Carolyn. Here, I figured since you kept making faces, you'd like to get the taste out of your mouth. Sable set the bowl down in front of him, and he purred loudly enough I could hear him. Salmon, I may need to keep her. His face already buried in the bowl. I rolled my eyes at a smirking Sable. See, he likes me better than you. You get to convince him to exercise when he gets fat. I retorted. I heard that, Carolyn said, but didn't lift his head up at all. The snickers lightened the mood, and Sable made sure we all had our tea. I sat in the dark blue chair, a club style that I loved, while Joe and Sable curled up on the rose-colored settee. We all sipped tea, and the silence hung between us like a shroud. Spill, Joe finally said, looking between me and Carolyn. What happened? I took another sip of my tea, enjoying the bite of the whiskey and the heat. It didn't make sense I was so cold when the house was easily in the 80s. I started to explain everything, ending with, I opened my eyes to see Carolyn with his teeth in my arm. I rubbed my arm the rough texture of the bandages making me relive the experience. Jo nodded, her expression somber. You mentioned you'd try to wake us up? Her brows drew together in a frown. I know I was dreaming. Something about me on a cliff and there was a storm raging. But I didn't hear you. Can your mind speak be blocked by sleep? Carolyn sat back, the bowl empty and without a trace of salmon in it. He licked his paws and washed his face, but I got the impression of thinking rather than ignoring. It should not, he finally said. Much of what happened made no sense. What happened from your point of view? Sable asked. She had her legs tucked up under her and was curled up next to Joe. Their hips touched, and the tension I'd sensed earlier seemed to have faded. This time, his face washing was more avoidance than cleaning. Carolyn, I prompted. I needed to know this also. He huffed and focused on his other paw. You were restless, more than normal. 
Then you got out of bed. I had been aware of your motion, but that woke me fully. You turned, spun like a dog before it lays down. I kept calling you, and you didn't hear me or didn't respond to my calls. I remained content to watch you, but then you turned and headed out of the room. I tried to get your attention by scratching you, but it did not get a reaction. He nodded at Joe and Sable. When Corey opened the door, I raced down to your door, but you did not hear my calls. Either via mind speak or vocalizations, I tried to turn the handle, but it was locked. I came back here and saw Corey standing in front of the memento room. That phrase made me blink, but it felt accurate. A room for things that had no obvious purpose, that qualified as mementos. Carolian shifted at this point, taking the Egyptian cat pose and looking at us, his whiskers close to his skull, eyes steady, and tail wrapped tightly around him as he sat up perfectly straight. I panicked and stopped her the only way I could think of with a minimal amount of damage. I swallowed hearing that, and Joe and Sable looked even more worried. What do you think it means? Joe asked, and her hand reached out to grab Sable's. They held hands like two scared kids, and I cringed at what my actions had caused. I think... I felt the words out as I said them. Magic and the house are both trying to test me. Remember the discussion I told you about with Georgaz and Banyarl after I faced the Emperor of Japan? That had been terrifying. Not only had I sidestepped to Japan from Atlanta, but I'd engaged in a magic fight with the court magician of Japan. The only reason I still breathed was Georgaz, James Wells' familiar, showed up and cowed him. The same James Wells' spirit Merlin that left me this house and more if I fulfilled the terms of the will. Yep, the scary beans showing up to tell you about magic? Yes. My Malkin is fearsome, is she not? The pride in Carolian's voice made me grin. Yep, I think this is more Harold stuff. Maybe trying to get me to attack or run or who knows, curl up in a ball and cry? I shrugged. This was yet more stuff that I didn't want to deal with. Do you think it might be right? Sable asked slowly, as if scared she was poking a sleeping dragon. What part? I was a bit lost, but my mind was jumping from point to point so fast that I didn't know anything anymore. About you having so much power that you need to use it differently. I flinched back and looked at her, eyes wide. What do you mean? Sable threw up her hands. Corey, you're so powerful. You can do things with a fraction of offering that would take me all my hair to pull off. Should you be maybe using it differently? I know you want to figure out what happened to Stevie, but what about other stuff you could do? You could get with a research lab and create vaccines and cure things. With your power in Carolian, you can make cells alter to fat diseases. All the problems we usually have with replicating mage-based results could be bypassed because you are that powerful. If she had said that as an accusation, I would have jumped up and stormed away. Instead... I was worried and a bit pleading, and that made me settle down and ponder everything. I don't know. I've been thinking about my magic as something to deal with, not something I could leverage for other things. And I hadn't. The costs for most people were prohibitive, and they taught all the classes like that. You did magic in tiny little things, not big things. But me? I could do big things. I sat there stunned, wondering about my own stupidity. Why had I never thought about it that way? And did it change anything? We talked a bit more, but the rocking of my thoughts didn't smooth out. As we got up to head back to bed, Sable walked over and pulled me into a hug. Remember, this is above all else, Corey. We love you. And you are a part of our lives. We will make this work out even if we need to create our own path. All three of us ignored Carolyn muttering, Triad and Coven. I lay in the nest of blankets, the idea still bouncing on the walls of my mind. 
Caroline curled up next to me, his body a warmth I craved. Lying next to him, his soft fur and purrs helped me to relax. I won't let you come to harm, my queen. I promise. And I'll figure out another way besides biting you. A chuckle slipped out as I buried my face in his fur. That would be appreciated. Apprehension about sleep didn't keep me awake, and I slipped away, protected by his waves of sound. Chapter 10 More equal opportunity programs are being implemented to ensure that we have non-mages and STEM-based jobs, but opponents point out that mages are naturally more skilled at science, otherwise they would not have emerged with powers. This implies it is a waste of time and resources to try and get non-mages educated to the same level, to educate the rest of us. Freedom from magic. To my relief, I slept through the night. I woke to Carolyn nudging me with his head. Bacon is being cooked. I have great need for bacon. I groaned and rolled over, stiff and my arms sore. Go, I need a shower. And leave me some bacon. He jumped off the bed and headed to the door, lifting his front paw to turn the knob. From what I could see, most of the mischief he could get into with his opposable thumbs had been experienced, and he at least acted like a responsible teenager. Mostly. With a body that felt way older than my age, I shuffled to the bathroom. The luxurious shower and near scalding water improved my outlook on life to a great degree, It helped to the point I was almost polite as I headed into the kitchen in search of coffee. Here, Joe shoved a mug in my face. Drink, no grudging. The aromas of cinnamon, chocolate, and coffee assaulted me in the best way possible. You made Stinky's Mexican coffee. I sighed in pleasure at the scents. I grabbed it and sat down in the breakfast nook. Stinky, a.k.a. Sanchez Guzman, was one of Joe's three brothers, and the one closest to us in age, only being two years older. He made the best Mexican coffee, strong enough to raise the dead and make them happy about it. Yes, I finally convinced him to share a secret. She smirked. You feeling better? I think so. Still trying to process my paradigm shift. I don't understand why I never thought about it. Joe shrugged. You're very goal-oriented and you have a habit of ignoring any possibilities outside what will get you what you want. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it can put blinders on you. I blinked at that. Like what? Joe laughed and started ticking things off her fingers. You never thought of asking for help with your parents? You were determined to get this house and your degree? Never occurred to you to maybe transfer or offer to give Japan the records they wanted? You never thought about loans for living and school? and any bank would have loaned to a double Merlin in a second. You put everything in terms of what you could do or handle, and never did you spend time as a kid thinking about what you would do with magic. I did. Sable did. I saw my parents use it for things all the time, so I'm used to it as a practical tool. You see it only as an obstacle to overcome, not something that can make your life better. Oh. I buried my nose in the coffee feeling attacked on all sides, but she wasn't wrong. That doesn't mean you're wrong, you know. Sable walked in, carrying a notebook. I looked up at her comment and frowned. But Joe just said I was. I did not, Joe protested. At the same time, Sable laughed. That is not what she said. I sat back, now feeling lost. I really thought by now I'd have been a grown-up figured out. Blanders aren't wrong. You are the most focused and driven person I've ever met. You've overcome things most people would never be able to. Just means you're not perfect. There isn't anything wrong with having blanders. But now that you've had information pointed out, does it change anything? Sable graced me with a stern look before she grabbed dishes and dropped bacon and some more salmon on a plate, setting it on the small table for Carolyn. Carolyn sat there and began to eat. 
For some reason, if he ate at the table, he used his paws, delicately feeding himself. But if it was on the floor, he ate like any other cat. I'd asked him once, and he just flicked an ear at me, responding with, Because that is how I choose to eat. She gave me bacon, French toast, and potatoes O'Brien. Joe was the cook of the three of us, but Sable wasn't bad, leaning more towards salads, oriental cuisine, and hors d'oeuvres than Joe. Joe went for Hispanic and Latin American dishes, which meant spicy. Me? I ate whatever they cooked. While I could actually be trusted in the kitchen now and not destroy everything I touched, I still rated as a very rudimental cook, but I could wash dishes like no one. I don't know if it changes anything. I still think an MS in biology with a PhD in quantitative biosciences is the way to go. With that, I could become a doctor, a researcher, a pathologist, or really anything. I think, assuming the draft board approves... I could be useful in the field as a forensic pathologist and medical expert. I just don't really want to deal with patients. But at the same time, remember how the doctor helped Stinky? I directed this at Joe. She sank into the chair next to me, her own plate piled high as she'd taken double the amount of French toast I had. Oh yeah, that was terrifying when the jack snapped and dropped the car on his legs. He could have died. Or best case, had his legs amputated. That doctor being there, moving those bone fragments away from arteries and getting them to heal in the right places? Joe shook her head. Even so, he had physical therapy for months to get everything strong enough to walk without risking his bones breaking again. See? That is a doctor that's using his magic. What if I lean towards that? Joe made a hmm noise and cut up her French toast into small towers of syrup, peanut butter, and toast. Honestly, because I think you would hate it. You like the immediateness of being a paramedic. You solve the problems, then move on to the next one. I think you'll be happier in the field doing, oh, I don't know, search and rescue? Digging through crime scenes? Solving mysteries? I mean, I can see you playing with things in the lab, but only if it was a constant altering and tweaking. But at the same time, you could save hundreds of people if you knew how to fix things. She shrugged. Mommy and Poppy didn't do anything exciting for their draft. Poppy fixed cars and Mommy worked on nuclear plants regulating temperature. I nodded slowly. Marisol was a fire wizard, and that made sense. Her dad was a genius with mechanics, which was where Joe got it from. My advice? Sable offered, waiting until I nodded at her to go on. See where they put you in the draft. You never know what you might enjoy, and you can always do other stuff as a volunteer if you think your abilities aren't being used fully. I blinked at her as the idea settled in. Volunteer. I can do that? Sable shrugged. Depends on what that is, but given what I know about you, if you set your mind on something, nothing will stop you from getting it, as Japan learned to its embarrassment. They both snickered at that, I wrinkled my nose. It wasn't something I liked to remember. If Georgas hadn't shown up, I would have been killed. Maybe you have a point. I have magic, but can I use it? Wrong question. You can. The question is, will you? Sable countered, smirking at me. How are you going to use your magic? I was suddenly curious. They were right. I'd been so focused on getting through and getting a degree... I hadn't spent much time thinking about magic as something that I could do, just something I had to deal with. I swear, some days I feel like a Merlin-cursed idiot. Her face lit up with excitement, and I felt even smaller. They had me working at one of the major water processing plants in Atlanta after my draft orientation. That, I knew, averaged about a month. Not boot camp, but from the clues Alexan and Indira had dropped— More indoctrination. I'll be able to use water to sense impurities, isolate them, then walk through steps in the plant processes to improve how they filter. I'm also going to get to work with how the sewage is processed, and if my thesis is correct, I should be able to decrease the amount of waste that can't be broken into biodegradable parts by over 50%. 
The director of the facility has been talking with me, and we're both excited. I'll be burning offerings left and right for the first few months, but if it works the way I theorized, it should be a huge improvement that can be extrapolated out to other plants. Her excitement was contagious, and I knew I should have asked before. I'm a really horrible friend, aren't I? I said, then flushed when I realized how utterly selfish that made me sound. Joe and Sable both laughed at me. Then Joe choked as she inhaled a bit of breakfast. When she quit trying to cough up her lungs, they looked at me. Corey, people were trying to kill you. That is guaranteed to narrow your attention to the bare minimum. And after that, you were taking classes and working and training with Banyarl, plus working through the memory stone. It's okay. But maybe now you can take a deep breath and start to live a bit, not just survive. You two are too nice to me, I muttered, staring at my French toast. No, we just understand you and love you. The strength of Joe's tone caught my attention, and I looked up. But I'm not letting you slide anymore. From now on, if you're being a bad friend, I'm going to call you out on it. Got it? Got it. And I will try. And yes, there isn't a reason to kill myself getting my master's and doctorate. And I will try different things to see what I can do not just learn it. I could do a lot, and with the amount of power Caroline gave me, I'd be able to do a lot. The question still was, do what? I rolled that around in my mind, but I'd probably need to talk to Indira and Stephen Alexant to really understand, or ask Sable when she started working. Atlanta? Sable grinned and reached over to squeeze Joe's hand. Yes, apparently being the girlfriend of a double Merlin's best friend has its perks. When I mentioned I'd like to stay near you, they jumped all over it. And I'm not complaining, as it makes life easier. Though we will need to talk about living quarters. Oh, yeah, you get paid, don't you? How much are they starting you at? I was just curious, but if she didn't tell me, I wouldn't worry about if she was hiding things. Her grin got bigger and smugger. How about 85000 to start? Standard wage for a master's in environmental engineering and an archmage. Though, remember, with the draft, you don't always get to work eight hours a day. You're on call for the entire period of your service. But it means I can afford a bigger place. She looked a bit wistful. Maybe with more closet space and a bigger bathroom. Heck, maybe even a den or office for you two. I giggled at that. What? You want room to put your clothes? You could always just throw away anything Joe has that you don't like. Hey, Joe protested, but we both just laughed at her, and she sank back and groused. I like my clothes, okay? Sable laughed and patted her hand, over the top patronizing. I know, dear. It's okay. I snickered at Joe's look. We chattered about nothing important but I felt better and knew I needed to work on my part of this relationship, which was what it was, a real relationship, my family. We cleaned up. Carolyn swore his paws weren't strong enough to handle doing dishes, and we still hadn't decided if we believed him or not. Once everything was clean, we moved to the sitting room. It was nice enough, but as I looked at it, I could see things I wanted to change, mainly some more comfortable furniture, The couch in there didn't qualify, and maybe a TV. While we didn't watch it a lot, movie nights were something we looked forward to. Maybe after I graduated. Joe and Sable had pulled up apartment listings on their phones. From their comments, they were trying to balance out distance between her work and us getting to school. I let them be. I figured I still needed to get to know the quirks of the house. Carolyn jerked up his head the movement catching my eye as he looked at the back of the house. I felt the telltale spike of pain when a door between our realm and another was opened. Incoming. Chapter 11 The realms remain a mystery. Those few who have gone there return insane or they don't return— Even the most ardent conspiracy theorists admit going into a realm, or worse, attracting the attention of those denizens, is a death warrant. 
it doesn't take a mage to realize dragons have no issues eating humans. Magic explained online. Wait, what? Who? I looked at Carolian, confused as he stretched, the stretch and flexing of very sharp claws into the upholstered ottoman did nothing to soothe or relieve my anxiety. Esmir and Banyarl are in the backyard. He headed towards the back of the house as I exhaled a long breath. Those two I could deal with, and I admitted I was excited to show them my house. My house. The phrase still made me giddy. I followed him out as I heard Joe and Sable behind me babbling, excited comments coming from Sable. She owed Esmir, Carolyn's mother, or Malkin, a huge debt. Over the course of two weeks last summer, Esmir reversed the damage to Sable's pancreas and cured her nascent diabetes. I'd watched and thought maybe I knew how to do it, but I needed to learn more about the human body before I'd ever feel comfortable doing that, which made my desire for medical school spike again. Isn't that an example of how I could use my magic? How many could I cure with my power and offerings? Not as many as there are, but... My thought choked there. How many people had diabetes in the U.S.? One million? Five? How could I ever begin to help that many? Even with my power? I couldn't, was the answer which sent me back to the question. How could I use my abilities to help others? My thoughts distracted me until I stepped out onto the screened-in porch and stopped, stunned by what I saw. Banyarl had always been imposing, even after we got to know him, but the pocket of reality he resided in, to my knowledge, made him seem a part of it, something that just fit there. Here, on an expanse of grassy lawn backed by an orchard, he looked exotic and somehow terrifying and regal at the same time. I'd forgotten, or didn't have anything earthly to compare him to, how huge he was. Here, his size screamed out at us as he was easily the size of a compact car. It didn't help that Esmir sat next to him in her Egyptian cat pose, looking around. Her emerald green fur made the grass and foliage from the trees seem dim and washed out. I couldn't remember them ever sitting so close together. And here, with measurement references I comprehended, it shocked me to realize she reached his shoulder, making her the size of a Shetland pony. I'm never complaining about how big Carolyn is again. I nodded in agreement with Joe's statement. If Carolyn got that big and I had a sudden horrified thought he might get bigger, people would run screaming when they saw him. I need a bigger harness. I muttered as I pushed open the back door and walked out. Even with my surprise and shock, a genuine smile appeared. I liked these beans very much. Banyarl, Esmir, what a surprise. Is everything okay? I walked towards them, resisting the urge to pet either of them, their fur was insanely gorgeous, but it would be like touching a queen's jewels, unwise and impolite. Esmir stood up and strolled towards us, rubbing muzzles with Carolyn. I wish to see your new abode. Banyarl mentioned magic, and I was curious. Her ears flattened as she gazed at the house. I see what he meant. I looked at Banyarl and saw his gaze locked on the house, and a frisson of unease wormed through my system. Is everything okay? Should I be worried? Banyarl ruffled his wings, then settled down. I think you should be wary, but worried would be excessive. I trained you well. I have faith you will rise to the challenges before you. I narrowed my eyes at him, then looked at Esmir, who had consented to let Carolyn lick her chin. As if she felt my attention, she glanced at me, her ear flicking. Do not look at me for reassurance, Kit. We are not allowed to tell you more than this. Be careful, and take care of my Kit. I will not see him injured or mourning. I threw up my hands, frustrated and exasperated. That tells me nothing! Be careful of what? 
What is in this house? Should I send Joe and Sable away? Who said you can't tell me more? I managed, barely, to keep from screaming. But still, my frustration leaked out because Esmir got up and walked over to me. I had to fight not to flinch back. Having a cat the size of a pony walk up to me hit all my atavistic responses. She licked the left side of my face, washing me with the scents of clover and honey, a combination that disconnected me even as it felt like three layers of skin were peeled off by her tongue. There is risk, but life is risk. But I think the bigger issue is do you not comprehend when we speak of magic? I resisted rubbing the area she licked. I'd check it later. What do you mean? When we say magic, Banyarl said, as Esmir stretched out on the ground, taking up more space than should have been possible. What do you think we mean? I shrugged and glanced over at Joan Sable. They had flopped down next to Esmir and Carolyn, and were lavishing attention on them. From their laughs, I figured one or both of the calves were talking to them. I figured your goddess or something? Now worried what else I'd misunderstood. Esmir lifted her head and glanced at Banyarl, then laid back down, arching her neck to allow scritching. I couldn't figure out if the cats, with human level or above intelligence, treated it like a massage or something else. Either way, the idea of people randomly touching me creeped me out. That is not accurate, Banyarl said, settling down into a sphinx pose, his wings flat against his back, creating a wash of purples against his white. If I had any artistic abilities, I'd have begged to sketch or paint him. But that wasn't where my skills lay. With most of my life spent dealing with my luck, I didn't have a ton of hobbies. But I did enjoy crocheting and hope to have time someday to learn to knit. Maybe I'd try to create a miniature banyarl. Knitting and crocheting had the advantage of worst case. I just undid it and started over. Nothing horrible would really happen. If she isn't your goddess, what is she? I sat down on the grass, ignoring the prickling of the blades on my bare legs. It was still too hot to wear anything besides shorts and tank tops. Though if I moved here, I'd need to invest in warmer clothes if the anecdotes were true. Banyarl bent his head back preening a feather before he answered. Know that while I have spent time in your realm, I have not had the opportunity to interact with very many humans over the years, nor immerse myself in your culture. But if my understanding is accurate, she is analogous to your mother nature and just as powerful in her own way. That made me sink back and think. We talked about Mother Nature both as a force and a being, and if that was what magic was. Is your magic a sentient being? I don't believe what we call Mother Nature is sentient. We call our ecosystem that, as it is huge, and our science can't figure out how to control or predict it. With everything I'd learned from him, I wasn't about to discount the possibility Mother Nature was sentient though it would tilt me towards the opinion of her being a royal bitch. Possibly. He shuffled his wings again, avoiding my gaze. Patterns have been noticed, and there are instances of something approaching sentience, but it is also possible it is nothing more than currents and our interpretation of them. Even Tursane remains wary when magic seems to demand from us. Think of it like swimming against the current. While it is possible, most are not going to succeed, and the consequences could be deadly. But I do know that the more powerful the person, the more likely magic is to pay attention. He paused, and I didn't interrupt, guessing he was trying to find words to explain. Over the last 18 months of him teaching us, I'd realized much of how they used magic was instinct, and most realm creatures approached it more like an art form than the cut-and-dry science that ruled how humans viewed magic. 
but that meant sometimes I fought to understand what he taught. The basic elements as creatures I got, but this, I didn't know how to parse. Does that mean magic is testing me? Does she want me to do something? Why me? Bane Jarl looked at Esmir, who didn't even glance up as she appeared to be enjoying the conversation between her, Carolian, Sable, and Joe. You are no help, Esmir. I snickered. It was the first truly human emotion I'd seen from him. It did my heart good to know that Kath could annoy anyone. He bounced his wings and sighed. It is probably more accurate to say you are drawing her in. Think of it like gravity. Your power draws in beings. Like Carolyn and Esmir, they are drawn to you like objects in space are drawn towards gravity wells. I had the urge to ask him how he knew about gravity and the solar system, but he kept talking. Think of it as you attract magic, and she has expectations of those that are worthy of her attention. He huffed, and I got the impression he was trying to describe color to a blind man. I huffed, matching him. (sighs) Basically, you are saying accept it and quit trying to make it be logical or make sense of it. Exactly. Three voices chimed in my head, creating a horrible stereo effect. Thanks, I said to the sound of Joe and Sable's laughter. So, did you want to see the house? I offered, though I wasn't sure Bainerall would fit. No, he replied instantly, along with a more polite but just as firm, No, thank you, from Esmir. I looked back and forth between them. Do I want to know why? Esmir rose from her willing servants. Joe and Sable both looked a bit sad to quit petting, but they stretched and rose too. I had to admit, if I hadn't need to talk to Banyarl and wanted to be able to concentrate, I might have joined them. Carolyn's fur was soft and thick, like a red rabbit. Esmir had fur that came across as mink with her dense coat. Running your hands through it made you smile. It was the best stress reliever I'd ever found. Carolyn said his coat would never do that. It was more common with females than males. Until you have settled everything with whatever presence or even magic herself, it is not wise for us to come to its notice. She tail-lashed Banyarl. He snapped at her tail, but it came across as playful. For all that, his beak could sever her tail if he caught it. But we can come here as long as we do not intrude on its domain until that time. I turned to look at the house. It didn't seem unfriendly, the way houses in horror movies did, but it did seem aware of me and mine. But I still wasn't afraid. So be it. I have power. I guess maybe I should face up to that. My voice sounded small and quiet even to my ears. Joe snorted. (laughs) Why do I get the feeling I should have you shouting that regularly like a marching cadence? Because I'm conflicted? Remember everything Alexan said about downplaying my power? I muttered. Yes, to the Omo and draft board. Not to yourself. You need to understand and control your own power. Not avoid it as hard as you can like you have for the last year. Sable's comment cut, and I threw up my hands. Fine, I'm a powerful bitch. Is that what you want to hear? My voice was loud, and I glared at all of them. Magic crackling around me, waiting for me to ask it to do something. Anything. Yes! Joe and Sable chorused while the three other realm creatures chimed in with the same affirmative. And then we all broke into laughter. I shook my head. May I offer you refreshments at least? That would be excellent, Esmir purred. Carolyn has been telling me about your salmon? Joe laughed as she turned to go in. Same for you, Banyol. It's a fish. That sounds most intriguing, he admitted, and they both settled back down. Carolyn posed in front of them. I got the distinct impression they were grilling him, and from the occasional laid-back ears and tail lash, it wasn't all good. As one, without communicating, we backed up and headed into the house. 
What do you think they're chewing on him about? Joe asked as she dug in the refrigerator. Maybe that we found out he can read? I offered. I bet it's more about you, Sable said, winking at me. Your focus isn't getting you to understand everything. Ha! Huh, that means he'd explain something, and he rather doesn't. I shrugged. Carolyn was my friend. The rest of the oddness of the mage-familiar relationship was something I didn't dig into much. Too scared I'd ruin it. My phone chimed, and I dug it out of my pocket. A notification glowed there from Indira. Chapter 12 Derek Stone, Air Merlin, takes on rogue mages and removes the threat to the world in the action-packed Rogue Mage 3. See him use his abilities to stop those evil mages threatening to destroy Buckingham Palace. Will he have enough offering to stop this evil group? Watch it, opening weekend. Movie ad. I groaned and seriously considered deleting it unread, but that would be one more instance of me avoiding. Accept your power. You're a double Merlin for Merlin's sake. Act like it. The pep talk helped a little, and I tried to center myself. This was my life. I could control some aspects of it, so I needed to dive in and start doing that. Here was the first step. What is it? Joe asked, putting salmon into bowls. She turned to study some marinades sitting on the shelf. I really want to play with their taste buds. We never introduce them to much food outside barbecue. Which Banyarl had thought was the best thing he'd ever tasted, though he preferred Carolina barbecue sauce to any of the sweet ones. Indira, which means Alexant, I said as I pulled up the text. He's gotten better, you know, Sable commented. She handed Joe a bunch of ramekins to create spice options. There were days when I was surprised Joe didn't want to become a chef, but she liked cooking for friends and knew she couldn't compete with her mother. Besides, if she became a chef, cooking wouldn't be fun anymore. I know, he's nice most of the time now, or at least not a complete ass. I pulled up the text message and read it out loud. Corey, we will be there tomorrow afternoon. Please be ready to leave the day after. The government would like to do a trial run with you, and it is a serious situation. Thank you. Sable grinned. Well, it's obvious Indira sent that, not Stephen. But fudge, that means you're leaving us. She had an odd mix of worry and excitement on her face. I smirked at her. Yes, and don't you dare have sex in my room. She laughed. <laughs> Wouldn't dream of it, but the back porch, maybe. I took the tray Joe handed me and headed out. Sable had two folding TV trays. Who knew where they had found those? Joe had another tray with ramekins and set it all up in front of the two very interested creatures. By the end of the experiment, I figured we could start a trade war for salmon and spices if the groans of delight were anything to go by. As far as I could figure, they didn't have spices in other realms, and even salt surprised them. Banyarl loved the teriyaki and hot pepper mix, while Esmir was partial to the sea salt and lime especially over the salmon. Both of them thought the mustard with spices had serious potential. Jo promised when she had her own place, she'd host a dinner for them. From the amount that they ate, I hope she planned on saving up. They headed out when the telltale honk of a delivery from Amazing broke up our morning. The three of us unboxed everything I ordered, and I figured the new mattress would solve all my problems. Well, solve my sleeping problems, I had to resist the urge to take a nap on it as my night had not been restful. The wounds on my arm had quit throbbing, which was a relief. Joe and Sable decided to spend the afternoon exploring the local area, and I waved them off, hoping they had fun. I headed upstairs, the rooms calling to me. Ready to explore the treasure room? I asked Carolyn, who'd eaten way more than his fair share of salmon. He'd changed his mind and decided he liked Joe's spicy stuff and would eat his meat drenched in it. My eyes watered just smelling it, and he thought it was the best thing ever, though he did ask for milk to quench his tongue. 
He told me once it tasted like fire smelled. Which you decided to do after everyone leaves. He bounded up the stairs, his tail dancing like a streak of fire. Yes, if anything bad happens, I don't want to risk anyone. Besides, I'm supposed to embrace my power, right? He sat at the door and stared back at me, his ears perked forward. Of course, I want a brave, powerful queen. That still tells me nothing. He didn't reply, just looked at me. I glared at him. We became locked in a glaring contest, but being a cat, he won when I blinked. Someday I will figure out exactly what that means. I pointed out. He licked his shoulder, expressing just how worried he was about my threat. Cats, I muttered as I opened the door. It swung back against the wall and I looked at it. So, just to prove I'm not reckless, I said. I went over to the study and grabbed the ottoman. It had to have weighed at least 30 pounds. I dragged it out and braced it against the door. Even if the door managed to move it, it would block the door from closing. If it didn't, well, I could always sidestep. That neat ability had both gotten me into a lot of trouble and ended it at the same time. Stepping through magic to Japan had freaked out the government and OMO. I'd had to tell them the offering was nothing that I expected, and only Carolyn and Georgas had made it possible. It wasn't a lie. I had figured sidestepping to Japan might make me bald. Instead, it only took a portion of the blood and eye core exposed by my wounds. I didn't even tell Joe how little the cost had been. Not lying, just not sharing information that might get her hurt or killed. I didn't want the government to ever realize that I could cross the world with the same amount of effort it took for most people to step off a curb. I shook off the memories and stepped into the room, focusing on the statues and the obelisk that looked too familiar. Carolyn brushed against my leg as he headed into the room to investigate the four main objects. They took up most of the space, but you could still move around them. In a rough square, the woman at the front stared at me with such active arrogance I expected her to sneer. As opposed to my shorts and tank top, she wore an elegant suit and stood a full two inches taller than me in heels. Is it just me, or is she intimidating? I didn't really expect Carolyn to respond. The woman looked powerful and confident. Everything I needed to become. She screams power but arrogance is deadly when it comes to magic. I had no idea how I could hear a capitalization, but I did. You think magic did this? Of course she did. But the question is, did a human help, or did magic act on her own? I swallowed, looking at the woman. Wait, this was a person? Is a person. I choked and looked at him. My ability to breathe locked away. My vision pulsed black and hard before I forced myself to inhale. It's a person? I gasped out, stepping back a bit. Yes, though maybe was is accurate. He sounded thoughtful, and I had to fight not to let the bile in my stomach explode outward. A Merlin, double like you, but she is in permanent stasis. Alive, but not alive. Think you're cryonics. We'd watched a movie with people being frozen. An old movie from the 1990s. Carolyn had sided with the bad guy in the movie, agreeing it should all devolve into chaos, as he reminded me was his nature. Okay, that is creepy. How do I bring her alive? And double Merlin? The idea of sitting in suspended animation horrified me. Just kill me right out, please. I leaned closer to look at her temple, but didn't see a double tattoo. Carolyn's ears laid back, and he hissed at me, teeth bared, muzzle pulled back. You do not interfere with magic's judgment, ever. She made her choices. These are the consequences. But there's a person there. I wanted to protest, but it came out too weak to qualify. 
And there are kids starving in chaos. You cannot save them all. And those that earn their punishment deserve no reprieve. He glared over his shoulder at me and moved further into the room. I sighed and followed him in. The other woman had different clothes on, like something from a historical movie set in the Orient. I couldn't say when, just nothing modern and not a style I'd ever seen. I glanced at her feet, and they were tiny, with strange shoes on. Her smooth hair and round face should have been expressionless, but instead I could read a dark avarice, a greed that made me shudder. It changed her from almost pretty to one step away from something out of a horror movie. I turned to the last man, almost hoping for someone with a simple smile on their face. He had on a fancy robe that fastened down the front. It reminded me of something I once saw in a movie about people in Eastern Europe, maybe around the Middle Ages. I didn't know if I should be relieved it wasn't another woman, but his expression provided no relief from the emotions churning in my stomach. He had a smile that I'd seen Indira mimic. Sex, power, hunger. But hers had been a pale imitation compared to what I saw on his face. But the emotion that put all of them into simple notes was the wrath that hid behind it all. A wrath that even as a statue made me want to avoid angering him. He'd be a king with a harem of women, and his advisors would all be scared to say anything that was against his wishes. His enemies' heads would be on pikes before his castle. I had a hard time taking my gaze off him. That is probably why he is here and not alive in whatever time he came from. Ignore them. They have no bearing on our lives. I turned to see Carolyn up on the top of one of the shelves. What are you doing? What if you break something? I headed towards him, sure he was going to start sweeping things off. He'd done it before. I'm not a mindless cat. I have no wish to unleash some of the things in here. Though, you could place eggs on the high shelves for me to knock off. That would be entertaining. I glared at him, not that it did any good. Even his mother couldn't change his mind with a look. I think not. I will see about buying a cat-sized mop and broom for you to clean up with. Outside would be interesting also. He cajoled as he wove around the objects on the shelves. This time I ignored him and started pursuing the shelves. The place radiated a magic that, once I looked for it, was obvious. I wanted to pick up and fondle everything but that seemed unwise. Do you know what they are? All of them? No. Some smell of magic I have never encountered, but many of them I know, and there is a logic to this organization. That would help a lot. That and the pride in his voice reminded me that he wasn't even two years old yet. Share, oh wise one. I encouraged, making my tone respectful. He still flicked his ears back at me, but he jumped back down to the ground. The room had seven sections of shelving, two per wall, but the one with the door only had one. He headed to the section near the door. This section contains parts of magical creatures, including Jorgas's feather. I believe there are a few dragon scales, an egg, the feather of a rock, fairy hair, unicorn hoof clipping and a few others I do not know, though I suspect Esmir would. I looked at the shelf warily and lifted my hand to feel for the scale from Tursane on the back of my spirit symbol necklace. They aren't like trophies, are they? I mean, where someone killed for them? The idea vaguely horrified me. I all but heard the huff of exasperation as Caroline flicked his tail at me. While he thought trophy hunting was stupid, None of the beans I'd met from the realm saw anything wrong with hunting another bean for food, for revenge, for ingredients. They also placed no blame when the hunted killed the hunter. It kept their society oddly polite, not that I'd seen much of it outside a few odd tea or tasting parties. I smell no blood, and the hair of a fairy is something you would not take if you had managed to kill one. 
They are powerful magic users, not rulers, but they control their own realms within all of the realms. So they are tokens, much like the scale from Tursane. But I do not know the terms of these tokens or how to activate them. I thought about the idea of fairies. Even though we still had classes twice weekly with Banyarl, he said that would change when school started back up. I had met no more beans besides those I'd already met. Was that normal? Carolian, how many creatures are in the realms? He stopped in front of another shelf, this filled with many roundish objects, all glowing slightly, and they ranged from the size of my fist to a football-sized one. How would I know? Do you know how many beings are on your earth? I shrugged. About 7.5 billion, give or take. But I meant how many types of creatures are there. He flicked his tail at me. As many as wish to be. These are all learning stones from many species and times. In a move faster than I could have stopped, he sat back on his haunches and touched one the color of a tin bucket and just as shiny.